Hello everyone. The past few weeks I have been doing live readings of my book, A Yule Story, uh, and I started with chapters one through four, and then I did five through six, and then I just did seven to the end. And so what I really wanted to do is compile all these into one video for you here. Um, if you want, do want to access this story uh, and, and hear it from my voice, just understand that this is a live reading, so it's not going to be perfect. There's going to be lots of stutters, maybe some breaks here and there. I did try to make sure that all of the pause segments I had during the live stream or kind of removed where I answered questions. That way you can kind of just hit start. And as soon as I'm done talking here, it'll go to the very end of the story. Just once again, understand this is a live reading, not an audible kind of thing. So it's not going to be perfect. The voices are going to change. I'm going to stutter. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to go back. Uh, but I just wanted to make sure that the story was available to anyone that wanted to read it or hear it. Um, but of course, if you do want to support me and you know the work that I made in this book, please think about heading down below. There's a link to the Amazon store where you can purchase a Yule story. It means so much. The time of making this video, 400 copies have been sold uh, and we have 40 reviews on Amazon floating around four and a half stars. So there's many ways to help this. Just watching this video helps a lot. Sharing it when you can, purchasing a copy, reviewing a copy. Um, there is also the hardcovers available now as well. I'll be releasing a second edition fairly soon and I'm going to get started on the sequel. I do additionally have a tier on Patreon for book supporters, and this is the tier where I give you insider information on the creation process. I'll be doing a Zoom call here soon to discuss like, you know, the ideas for the second book as well as new books in the series. And then also you will get a signed copy of the second book when it comes out near the summer. So with that, I'll go ahead and start playing through the live readings. I hope you enjoy a Yule story, and thank you for everyone who's helped support this dream and make it a reality. And I hope you enjoy, and happy Yule. It was the 19th of December. Eric was sitting in front of an electronic store watching a TV play, the Christmas classic Home Alone, one of his favorite holiday movies. It had just reached the famous scene of Kevin McAllister slapping his face with the aftershave and screaming at the top of his lungs. Christmas this year was shaping up to be even less magical than the year before. His family didn't even bother decorating their home for the holidays anymore. Eric looked over at his brother, who had lost interest in the big screen in the shop window, and instead had his head turned down to his little screen in his hands. How much longer is she going to be in there? Eric asked, his brother trying to start a conversation. You know how it is. She's got to try every lotion before buying the same one she gets every year for Grandma. Alan replied in a bored, uninterested tone. This year, they were not even going to visit their grandmother in Michigan, so their mother was going to send all of their gifts in the mail. And all, rare, er, and all Eric really could think about at this moment was getting some time in the woods behind their house before the winter sun set. The brothers were only six and eight when the quarantines of 2020 happened, which meant they played, an, which meant they played on an unnatural amount of video games. As things slowly got back to normal, the boys began to differ on their choices of activities. Alan couldn't seem to leave the digital world behind, while Eric was the complete opposite. After a couple of years of online school, online friends, and online everything, he was sick of it all. Before everything happened, Eric and Alan would play outside just as much as they would play inside. Life was just fun, and being brothers felt easy. Now there seemed to be a deeper and deeper divide between the two. Hey, Alan, have you seen any of those crappy sequels to Home Alone? No answer. Alan? What? Oh, yeah, I think so. I saw someone do a reaction video or something to the third one. We want to watch it tonight? It could be fun to make fun of it ourselves. And again, no answer. Bored, Eric led out sigh, and to his relief saw his mother walking out of the bath and body works with four bags in tow. She waved at them. Sorry that took so long, boys. I bet you're all very hungry. Why don't we go ahead and grab some lunch over the food court before we finish? What about the Pokeball place? It sounds really good, she said at lightning speed. Patricia was a producer at a big social media company downtown, which meant her mind was always busy with the analytics of 15 different social media platforms. This tended to make her mind a little scattered. Patricia was older than most of her co-workers, so she constantly tried to keep up with the trends of a woman 10 years younger than her. This also meant that she dressed about 10 years younger than her own 45-year-old self. She kept her hair, sh uh, her hair shoulder length and often dyed it fun colors. She was obsessed with fitness routines, diets, juices, detoxes, supplements, kombucha, and anything else she could find to keep herself in the loop. She tried her best, but even though how hard she worked at it all, she always felt a few steps behind her younger colleagues. Mom, can we just get a burger? I really don't think I like this place. What do they even have? Eric protested. Oh, don't worry, dear. I saw this avocado and quinoa mix I think you're going to love. Considering Eric was never never liked avocado or quinoa, the combination of the two most likely was not going to change his mind about either. 
but he had little choice. So he poked his brother to get him moving, and they headed off to the food court. As they were walking away, Kevin McAllister was beginning to use his wit to come up with a plan to defend his home from the wet bandits. Ah, oh, I really enjoy that these breaks in conversation, so I can take a drink of my Yule coffee here. And good morning to everyone that has joined in since then. Hope you're enjoying this reading. So Eric, honey, while your brother's in the bathroom, what do you think I should get him for Christmas this year? Patricia said between bites of quinoa and pickled cabbage. Well, there's a new skin that just came out that he really wants. A new what? She returned confused. A skin for his character in the game, Mom. Eric answered. Oh, right. Well, that can't be all he wants. Well, how much does it cost? I don't know. Probably 30 bucks. For that? Not exactly what I thought it hit to get him. But if that's what he's wanting... And what about you, Eric? What are you wanting this year? Patricia said, eyeing him while taking a drink from her kale juice. What did he want? Eric thought to himself. Dad is always the better gift giver than Mom. He always managed to find the one thing you didn't know you wanted. The last time Dad was alive to give presents was when Eric was only five years old. Oh, what do you think Dad would have got me this year? Eric choked out after some thought. At first, Patricia didn't seem to hear him, still busy drinking her juice eyes flickering towards the corner of the cafeteria. But then she spoke. Uh, I don't know, dear. You always... He always had a way of picking things out. Awkward silence. What about one of those toys from the new Star Wars shows? You, you like those as kids, right? Eric, honey, I, I honestly don't even know what you like anymore. As he predicted, Mom blew past the conversation about Dad. It had been six years, and it was still a tab taboo topic at the Horn household. Mom... I know whatever you get me, I'm sure I will like it, Eric said, trying to be the peacemaker. This seemed to be satisfying to his mother and calm the intensity in the air created by bringing up his father. It was at this time Alan finally showed back up from his extended trip to the bathroom. Having only finished their lunch, Patricia ushered the boys to continue their day of shopping, from clothing store to clothing store, overpriced candle star store to overpriced electronic store they walked. It was while they were in the toy store that Eric saw something that caught his eye. In the corner of the mall, tucked away behind a Dippin' Dots machine, was a seasonal pop-up store called the Yuletide and Holly. What Eric noticed most was the look of the store. It looked just like the North Pole in the old Christmas movies. Candy canes, Christmas trees, wrapped presents, wooden horses, stars, and garland. You could almost smell the fresh-baked cookies from across the small center court. Hey, Mom, can I have my money to get gifts? I, I think I know where I want to go. Eric was expected to buy his mom and brother something every year for Christmas, even though the money could, would come from Patricia. It was only about $10 for each gift, so small trinkets were all about all he could afford to get them. Uh, sure, honey, don't be long. Um, we have to get back home soon. His mother handed him the money from her purse and got back to her shopping. Alan marched along, carrying all of his mother's shopping bags, somehow still playing on his phone while he walked. Eric ran across to Yule Tide and Holly. He wasn't even sure if he was going to find anything. He simply wanted to get lost in the sights and smells of the store. The whole inner, uh, interior was decorated in a much older style of winter decoration than the rest of the mall. It had a warm glow about it as some fake candles flickered on all the shelves. Eric was enthralled with it all. Sadly, it seemed he was the only one. The store was nearly empty even five days before Christmas. Just as he was rounding a display full of wooden reindeers, he bumped into a woman. She was an older, gray in hair, warm in smile, and covered in wrinkles. Well, hello there. Winter's blessings to you. Welcome to my shop, the woman said with a warm, accented voice. What is your name? Now I sound like the nice Usandi. <laughs> hello, ma'am. My name is Eric, and I love your store. Well, hello, Eric. My name is Holly, and I'm glad you like it here. It's almost like my home. Now, what can I help you find? She smiled in a way that reminded Eric of his grandmother. I'm looking for presents for my mom and my brother, and I don't have a lot of money. Eric said, holding out his two $10 bills. Holly didn't even look at them before she began to glide around the store. She moved very majestically for a woman her age. She stopped first at a display of ornaments for a tree. Can you tell me about your mother? She said, still in her joyous tone. My mom? Well, she does her best, I guess. She raised us on her own for the last few years, works a lot, but still tries. We eat a lot of takeout and get a lot of time alone. She buys us a lot of gifts and we have a nice house. But he drifted off. But what? Well, she used to be different. When my dad was alive, things were just different. And now she's, she's, 
while Eric was talking, seemed to be Holly seemed to be feeling each of the ornaments, approving or disapproving as she came across them. She felt one and placed it in her pocket in a way that Eric wouldn't see. You know, Eric, what your mother needs is a blanket. Let me get one of the ones I've made myself. With that, she once again glided over to a wall full of the warmest, coziest looking blankets Eric had ever seen. She handed a red one over, and as Eric touched it, he instantly felt like he was being hot. Wow, you made this? It feels so soft, Eric said as he braced the cl blanket close to his chest. Now your brother. Tell me about him. Well, I can tell you he, what he was once like. He, he isn't really the same anymore. Not since we were stuck in the house for so long, and now he was locked into his phone and his games, and we don't really hang out anymore. Well, then tell me about what you remember of him from before. Well, Alan used to be my best friend. We, we did everything together. We would play outside, make up adventures, and, and sure, we would fight every now and then, but we would always get over it. And now if we fight, it doesn't go away, and the other half of the time, he ignores me. The only chance I get his attention is if we play video games together. Eric, remember, focus on the good. This only works if you focus on the good. Holly reminded him, peeking her head, head between shelves as she buried herself in. Okay, sorry. Eric closed his eyes, trying to think of the last time he really enjoyed spending time with his brother. Oh, okay, okay, there was this time right before Dad died, but that Alan and I were building forts of the couches. We, he set back the recliner and piled pillows and blankets around it. He, he called it Alan's world, and only redheads could come inside. Across the coffee table, took, I took all the cushions and made a wall around the space between the couches and the TV. I called it the Kingdom of Eric, where everyone could eat the ice cream all day long but no redheads were allowed. Well, I suppose I would be with your brother then. I used to be a redhead, which is sad because I do really love ice cream, Holly playfully replied. Well, maybe I would make an exception since your hair isn't red anymore, Eric said without thinking of how that could have been rude. I'm going to pretend like I didn't hear that. Continue your story. What did your boys do next? She returned going back to her search on the shelves. Well, you see, Alan wanted some of the ice cream, because all in the kingdom of Eric, we had all the ice cream. I mean, all of the ice cream in the house. So we could shout at me, so he could shout at me from across the room, trying to negotiate different toys for one of the buckets of ice cream. I knew his favorite, which was vanilla bean, so I made sure I had the book of it at all. That meant nothing was good enough for a trade. After negotiations failed, he began to shoot his toy guns across the living room. Oh my, well, did you shoot back? Of course, but Alan, Alan's pretty smart, and he, he takes sides with the other redhead in the family, Mom. The whole time he was shooting at me from the foam darts, Mom was crawling behind the couch, behind my walls, and grabbed all the vanilla bean ice cream. She screamed when all the melted ice cream came running down her shirt. You see, negotiations took pretty long, and that ice cream was out for hours. Was she upset with you? No, right at the start, uh, right as she started laughing, our dad came in to see what was going on. At first, he played the tough dad and acted upset when I ruined Mom's shirt. But then I, uh, then I saw him smile, grab the strawberry ice cream, and head for me. He then dumped the whole tub of liquefied strawberry ice cream on my head, saying that I would become the thing I feared most, a redhead. It sounds like you were very happy, Eric, replied Holly. It was a huge mess, but none of us cared. We all laughed so much, the walls of both our forts came apart, as we all just laughed in the middle of the living room. We cleaned everything up together and ended up playing board games after dinner. Yes, that is it, a board game, Holly exclaimed from the corner of the store. She came up to Eric with a flat box. My husband makes these out of wood, and I think it'll be perfect for you and your brother. Eric looked at the box, and it had a long and confusing word etched on the front. In, 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 Eric tried his best to pronounce it, but was clearly struggling. It's pronounced Neffeltoffel, Holly chuckled warmly, even though it's spelled Neffeltoffel. The H is silent. It's a word from my home country. It's a lot like chess. Do not worry. We'll, you will know how to play. He will know how to play it when you give it to him, she said with a slightly mysterious tone in her voice. Okay, Eric. I believe we are all finished. Follow me and I'll get these wrapped up for you. They then walked back to the hidden counter in the store. There was an old register on the wooden counter, complete with brass buttons and the little cards has the cost on it. Eric looked at Holly with some suspicion. Ma'am, I don't think I have enough money for this. You actually, you actually have just as much enough money, you see. She typed a few things into the old register, following a loud bring, and the card saying $20 exactly, in big red bold letters. She smiled and went back to wrapping the gifts in brown paper. 
tying them with thick, colorful ribbons. She then put a tag on each one, writing Mom on the red bo bowed parcel. She placed the blanket in the box so it was less obvious what it was, and then Alan on the other tag with the blue bowed box. Holly then pulled another parcel out from behind her back, a small box with a green bow. On it, the tag said, Eric. This one's for you, to show you thanks for telling me a wonderful story. But Eric, you must promise me you will not open it. Not until I tell you to. What? Uh, that, that doesn't make any sense, Eric questions. Promise me, Eric, Holly said with an intensity Eric, Eric had not expected. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I, I promise. I, I won't open it until you tell me to, Eric said with slight fear. I'm happy to hear that. It's a very special gift that will only make sense when the time is right. Holly, encouraging smile, returned as she finished speaking. Eric was then handed his stack of parcels in exchange for his two $10 bills. Just as Eric was about to leave, he heard Holly speak from behind him. Oh, Eric, Holly called back to him. Happy Yule. This confused Eric even more. He had never heard this before. Of course, he had heard Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, but never Happy Yule. Okay, uh, bye then, Eric squeaked out before heading back into the busy mall. Eric, there you are. We heard from down the hall. He heard from down the hall as his mother was frantically rushing towards him. Alan behind her now with more bags and still somehow on his phone. Where have you been? What store did you go into? You've been gone for so long. I've looked everywhere for you. Eric did not have time to answer any of her questions as she grabbed his arm and rushed him towards the nearest exit, taking talking at her famous speed, both questioning and lecturing him. The family then walked into the automatic doors into the cool Wisconsin winter air. The car sped up the highway through the light snow and the ever-darkening winter evening. Both the boys were in the back, Eric staring out the window and Alan into his own digital world. The family lived an hour from the city, which was just far enough to be able to be away. See, I'm already starting to fall apart. The family lived an hour away from the city, which was just far enough away to have a forest in their backyard. As far as Eric remembered, the family had always lived out here. It was their father's dream to have property with a pine forest behind it. He said it always made him feel at peace in the world, no matter what was happening outside of their home. Perhaps that's why Eric always liked the forest as well. Whenever he was in the trees, everything else in the world stopped existing. A feeling he was very much looking forward to do after this, uh, looking forward to after his day in the busy and crowded mall. Mom, when we get back, can I go into the woods right away? It's almost dark. You know how I feel about you being out there at night, Patricia protested. But mom, we were stuck in the mall all day. I, I really don't want to sit in the house after doing that. Please. Eric returned in his own protest. Fine, but you can only stay out there for an hour. After that, you come straight home and don't wander too far. Now, what do you boys want for dinner on the way in? I can pick us up anything you want. Eric, you mentioned burgers earlier. That sounds good. Doesn't it, Eric? And, and, uh, doesn't it, Alan? Alan answered with little more than a grunt, but it was a grunt that indicated a slightly positive, if not neutral, feeling towards burgers. Ugh. It was at this point, the Bluetooth speaker switched over to a phone call from work that Patricia had to take, leaving Eric alone with his thoughts once again as he watched the city turn into suburbs and eventually to the woods of a small town. Eric thought that the uh, Eric thoughts were then drawn to the gifts in the trunk of the car. His being the smallest was sitting on the top of pile of pile of beautifully wrapped boxes. His mom was very suspicious when she loaded the car and saw that he was able to get so much with only twenty dollars. The mystery of the gift was heavy on his mind as they pulled through the drive through of the nearest McDonald's, cheeseburgers and fries quickly ordered and devoured before they were even back at home. Alan had fallen asleep after finishing his meal, a whole day of carrying around mom's bags finally catching up with him. The sun was just barely over the trees and the outline of their house revealed itself. The Horn family house was two stories with modern architecture. It was designed by the boy's father before he and their mother got married. During the winter, the yard was covered with a thin layer of snow and they never seemed to fully go away. Mom, do you mind if I go ahead and go into the woods? Patricia seemed to think for a moment and then returned with, Eric, you can go now, but remember, only one hour out there and straight back home, okay? Eric quickly unbuckled his seatbelt and headed down the snow-covered yard to the path he would always take to go into the forest. He normally would bring a flashlight with him this late in the evening, but, the, uh, but that would involve take, backtracking into the house and he was not going to waste a single moment. Ooh, coffee break. See, look at me. I added those in for myself. His mother always wondered what he was up to in the forest, as if he had some big secret club hidden in the trees that Eric was a part of, when in reality he was most likely just walking around and exploring. Over the last couple of years, Eric nearly uh, had nearly the entire forest mapped out in his mind. 
every interesting tree, pile of rocks, and the shortcut home stored up in his thoughts. But this evening, he was heading to the area of the forest that really opened up. Sadly, it was because this part of the forest was owned by a local tree farm, and if, if in, a, in a few years, it would come through and cut it all down to plant again. Despite this, it made the whole area incredibly beautiful, with its trees growing in a straight line for what seemed like miles. It was already nearly dark, but even if he didn't listen to his mother, it was unlikely that he would uh, be punished. It was not really in the, her, their mother's nature to take anything away from the boys. This time of year, it could get dangerous if it got too cold enough at night. That never really crossed Eric's young mind. Tonight, he found himself looking up at the canopy as he walked aimlessly around. The interweaving tree branches put him in a daze that he very much needed after the busy day in the city. As the remaining light was disappearing from the evening sky, stars were beginning to appear. However, the lights from the city always seemed to get brighter each night from the east, taking away from his celestial view. After a few minutes of walking, Eric looked to see how far he had come. Despite the repetitive nature of the forest, he could usually tell right away how far away he was from his house. But not tonight. It was very different. The path was darker than usual. The trees were a little closer than he remembered. And the familiar light breeze had gone still. He stopped moving. Okay, Eric. No big deal. You just went a little further than you usually do. Turn around and I'm sure you can follow your way, your footsteps back, Eric told himself. And that's what he did. Without seeming to skip a beat, he turned around and began walking back the way he came. This time, instead of looking up, he was looking down at the ground as he walked in his old footsteps. At least until his old footsteps disappeared. He looked around, surveying the snow for signs of his previous path. But there was no evidence he had ever walked over that snow. Not now, or even yesterday. Okay, now that's weird. I'll, I'll just look for the lights of home. Usually I can see them. But as Eric began to scan the horizon, he could not see any evidence of what direction his home was in. Panic was now beginning to creep its way from Eric's chest to his thoughts. There is no way I'm lost. I have done this a million times. Crap. Mom is not going to like this. His thoughts continued to race. His eyes continued to dance until he finally spotted a light. It was odd. He hadn't noticed it sooner. In the distance, there was a fire. As his eyes focused on the distant flame, he could faintly see the outline of a man sitting next to what he could tell was a camp, now tell was a campfire. Well, I am definitely not going that way, he whispered under his breath. Eric turned around to head in the other direction, and as he did, he saw the same campfire with the same man behind it. The man now moved his arm in a gesture that called Eric to come closer. Oh, hell no, Eric said louder this time. Once again, Eric turned around completely, this time at a sprint, and once again, the campfire seemed to relocate from behind him, with the same man sitting behind it, waving his arm towards Eric. But now Eric was even closer to the fire and could tell the man was older with a long white beard that came down to his knees. Hey, I don't know what kind of game you're playing at, but this is not cool, Eric yelled towards the orange glow in the snow-covered forest. The old man looked up at him, flames illuminating one half of his face alone. Come, Eric. We must speak. He knows my name, Eric gasped. In one last attempt to break free, Eric turned around again and ran as fast as he could, only to immediately trip and fall over a log, his face landing only inches from the campfire and the snow-covered boots of the white-bearded old man. Look here, mister. I, I don't want any trouble. Just let me go home. Eric, my dear boy, I'm not here to cause you any harm, only to talk with you around my fire here. The man... The way the man spoke reassured Eric, even though he was still looking for a way to get away. As Eric gained his courage, he looked up to see what the stranger looked like, and what he saw confused him even more, because the old man in front of him looked just like Santa Claus. Brown leather boots, deep red fur coat, pine cones hanging from his shoulders, he even had a fur cap that dangled down his back. The only difference was his clothes appeared older than the classic image of Santa Claus, and this man, this old man did not appear very fat. Mr. I don't know how to ask this, but this whole night, you, the beard, the hat, are you Santa Claus? The old man let out the most lively and jolly laugh Eric had ever heard. <laughs> oh, my boy. I have never, I have been called many things, Santa Claus being one of them, Father Christmas another. But on this cold winter evening, how about you call me by a different name? You will need Oh, Yule? Mr. Yulnir? I, I don't know. This is really strange. You don't know me, but you know my wife, came the jolly reply. Oh? She didn't mention that she had a husband, but why? Why? 
why are you dressed like Santa? How long have you been here? Wh what do you want? Where are you? In why are you in my woods? The line of questioning was uh, put to rest by the gloved hand in the air by Yulnir. Eric, my dear boy, if you give me a moment, I will explain everything and I will tell you what you need to do. The old man said with a slight smile and a stern glare. What do you mean, need to do? Eric said slowly and cautiously. What you need to do to bring back your father. Yulnir reached down and pulled up a small wrap package similar to the gifts Holly had wrapped for them earlier. It's a long and similar size to the loaf of bread. As Yulnir, Yulnir handed it over to Eric and placed it in his hands, he could tell it was fairly heavy. Go ahead and open it, Eric. He first undid the twine bow and held together the packaging, and then, with the paper loosened, he slowly unraveled it. What was revealed to him was a log, made up of several different small branches. There was a strong smell of pine and cinnamon as the paper was removed. Mr. Yulnir, what is this exactly? I like how it smells. Mr. Eric, this is a Yule log, an old tradition from a time and a world long forgotten. Unlike normal wood, this burns for much, much longer. In fact, once you light it, this will burn for many days, Yulnir explained. Ehrlich looked down to inspect the Yule log further. It seemed to have small symbols carved into pieces on the wood as well. Those, my dear boy, are runes. They are also from a long time ago, and they are what makes magic in this world. After saying this, Yulnir put his hand on the log and looked Eric in the eyes. Eric, this is what is going to bring back your father. These runes, your family, and most importantly, you are all the ways in which we are going to do it. At remembering his father's de death, Eric was filled with sadness, but the thought of seeing him again filled him with an equal amount of excitement. Why do you care so much about my dad coming back, Eric questioned. That is a story for a different time, Yulia replied in a determined tone. Okay, so all I have to do is light this and he comes back? My dear boy, if it only was that simple. The log must burn for 12 days at least for the magic to work. And remember that it will take you and your family to bring him back. The more you talk about your father, the deeper of love you feel for him and each other will make the flame burn bright hot. But Eric, the spell will not work if you do not talk about him. <sighs> we never talk about him, though. It's like when we it's like when he died, he just vanished from the earth. We don't even have any pictures of him in the house anymore, Eric said in both anger and sadness. And you think it's easy to bring back someone from the dead? Yulnir replied with a raised eyebrow. Eric let out a sigh and looked up at Yulnir's glittering eyes. Why don't I just tell him about the spell? Do you think they would believe you if you did? Point taken. Okay, so just talk about my dad. Keep the log burning. I think I can do that. There's more. Of course, Eric said in anguish. Consider this a hint to help you out. Your father loved this time of year. And the best way to remember him will be to decorate your house once again, Yulnir said, leaning back in his stump. Well, we have another problem there. We got rid of all the decorations. We gave them to a family up north. This is the first time something Eric had said. This is the first time um, er something Eric se said seemed to t make the old man think. He began to run his fingers through his thick white beard. Well, I think I can help with that. Tomorrow morning, after breakfast, Come out into the forest, and I will have another present waiting for you. It was hard to believe after only a few minutes ago, Eric was terrified and confused by this old man. And now, when he said something mysterious like this, it seemed normal. Okay, will you be there? Sadly, Eric, I am needed somewhere else. But you will be able to tell where it is. Trust me, he said with a wink. In the distance, echoing from across the forest, a faint sound could be heard. Both Yulnir and Eric looked in the direction of that noise. It was a quiet first, but then it began to pick up as he heard them by the as it was heard by them both. Eric, where are you? Eric looked like it's time. Oh, no. Eric, it looks like it's time for you to get home. Remember what I told you. Keep the log burning. Start it tonight, and in twelve days your father will return. You understand? Yulnir said, leaning in and putting his hand on Eric's shoulder. Yes, yes, sir. I, I think I do, Eric returned with a nod. Yulnir smiled and turned his eyes to look behind Eric, which made him look behind him to see the old what the old man was looking at. When Eric looked back towards Yulnir, he was gone, and so was the fire. Eric was not not even the same place in the forest. He looked around in bewilderment to see his home was just beyond the tree line. 
Eric, shouted his mother from behind the yard as she ran towards him in her hastily put together winter clothes. Where have you been? This is the second time you have disappeared today. Get in the house right now and get warm. You have me worried sick. You must be freezing. Eric did not argue and marched quickly inside the house, his hand wrapped tightly around the Yule log. All right. Chapter three of A Yule Story, The Yule Log. Being in Wisconsin, their house was designed for harsh winters. There was a mud room to change your snow boots, extra insulation so the water lines don't freeze, and a large fireplace in the center of the house. The inside of the home was very modern, but matched the preferences of both Patricia and her late husband. Robert was always more of an old soul and preferred things to be rustic and warm, while Patricia preferred the more modern look of a, trend, a trendy city condo. So their home had all the comforts of a cabin and the modern conveniences of living in a city, except it was three times the size of a city home. Eric entered the kitchen in the mudroom, Yule Log still under his arm. I told you one hour, Eric, she said in her harshest mom voice. I was actually getting worried. You know how it's supposed to snow every, even more tonight? Actually, you know what? You were grounded. That was out of character for her. Usually their mother was fairly lenient with punishments. Eric, being a 12-year-old boy, knew he could lessen the punishment. I'm sorry, Mom. I lost track of time and it went too far. I, I promise I won't do it again, Eric said in his saddest kid voice. What if I didn't go out at night anymore, only in the mornings when it's light out? Eric pleaded with her. His mother looked at him, still stern and holding her ground. Fine, but if I catch you at night out at night once more, that's it. You're stuck in the house until the rest of the month. Do you hear me, Eric? He nodded in compliance. Now, you must be freezing. Can I get you anything? Actually, do you mind if I start a fire? It'll help me get warm. His mother looked at the log under his arm, only for a second, and back to him. Fine, I'm going to make you some tea. I'll make you something warm, too. I'm going to make some tea, and I'll make you something warm, too. With that, she turned to the cupboard and pulled out two mugs. The house had an open floor plan in line with a modern aesthetic, so it was just a quick turn down the hall and into the living room for Eric. Back when his father was alive, the living room was covered in blankets, and even had a few of his hunting trophies along the walls. Now the room felt barren and cold, which made the traditional stone fireplace stick out as the main centerpiece of the space. It was rare that anything besides the television would give a glow into that room, as it now hung above the fireplace. But tonight, Eric would start a fire like his father had in the past. Alan was nowhere near to be seen, but the distinct sound of him yelling at his online friends over his headset could be heard from above. There was a small cabinet next to the fireplace where the fire starters and kindling was kept. Eric only hoped he could get a fire going. He was worried that the log had gotten damp in the snow and may not be able to catch, so he piled up some wood scraps and dryer lint in the middle of the pit. There were uh, there were some long matches to start the flame, but when he looked inside the cabinet, there was no other pieces of wood to catch a larger flame. Feeling a little worried, he looked over at the Yule log and he told himself, Well, Yulnir did say it would burn for twelve nights on its own, so he lit the pile of wood scraps and lint, and then placed the log on the fire, hoping it would be enough. Almost instantly, he realized it was not enough as the log, log suffocated the flame. He heard footsteps come, coming down from the kitchen, his mother's voice say, Eric, were you able to get the fire going? I don't think we have any wood. Her voice getting louder as she rounded the corner. Yeah, I don't think I got it going. What are you talking about, dear? The fire looks great. It was then that Eric realized that the back of his legs felt warm. He turned around to see the logs had not only caught, but was burning very bright. Oh, I guess it did get going, he said quietly, confused by yet confused yet by yet another mystery to add to the day. Patricia sat down on the couch and handed Eric his hot chocolate. For a moment, she seemed at peace, just looking at the fire, but it did not take long for her to reach up to, with the remote to turn on the television. Eric's heart sank a little. He had hoped that they were going to actually spend time together. Mom, can we not have the TV on for a while? And, and just, you know, hang out? Let me get caught up in the news real quick, and I'm all yours, was her reply. This time of year was big for social media companies, all fighting for market shares of holiday shopping, which meant Patricia was extra focused on trends on what was happening in the media. Eric accepted his, defe his defeat and looked out the window to see what, what he had started, that it had started snowing heavily enough that he could barely see the forest. He thought of his day, of Holly and her presence, of Yulnir and his secret task. Then, of course, he thought of his father and the prospect of bringing him back. As he drifted off into thought while looking at the snow-covered forest, a silhouette of a figure appeared in the distance. Eric squinted. He could almost see what looked like a Yulnir looking back at him. Just then, the lights went out and the TV shut off, followed off by the sound of Alan yelling upstairs. 
The power had just gone out. All that remained was the glow of the fire from the Yule log illuminating the living room. Then the unnatural glow of his mother's phone came up as she checked for outages. Looks like the power is out for the whole neighborhood and the town. There's outages being reported everywhere. No way of telling how long it's going to last. As soon as Mother finished speaking, they could both hear loud footsteps coming from downstairs, followed by Alan's annoyed voice. What's going on? Why did everything shut off? Clearly still wired from whatever game he was playing. Alan, honey, go grab some blankets and a pillow. We need to set up close to the fire tonight and until the power comes back on. Alan grunted and marched up back upstairs to grab his things. Patricia looking back towards the fire and then to Eric. Where did you find that log anyways? I saw you carrying it when you were outside. Uh, oh, I, I don't know. I was just walking around and found it under some branches. It seemed like a good log for a fire. And I wanted one tonight and knew we didn't have any wood. So, so yeah, he gave his mother, his mother gave him a side eye of disbelief. Well, I'm glad you found the log then. Just hope it lasts till the power's back on. As Alan came downstairs with his bedding, he almost brought his portable gaming console and began to play a moment he sat on the couch next to Eric. Patricia returned to watching the news on her phone, leaving Eric to read his book on his own. The family kept themselves busy for at least two hours, and no matter how much time went by, the fire did not die down. Hey, Mom, tomorrow, what do we have planned? Well, let's see. It's Sunday, which means we need to get to groceries for the week. I'll work from home all next week since your boys are off from school. That, that's it, I think, his mother replied. I know we haven't done anything in so long, but you think tomorrow we could decorate the house for Christmas? Oh, I'm not sure, dear. That's that's so. What's the point? So late in the season, it'll be Christmas before you know it. We don't have any decorations in the house, remember? She protested. Don't worry about the decorations, Mom. I, I think I know where we can get uh, where we can get some. I'll get them out tomorrow. Eric answered back excitedly. Well, if you. If you know where a secret stash of Christmas decorations are, then tomorrow we'll decorate with whatever you find. Eric could tell his mother was being sarcastic in a mom kind of way, looking over to Alan as she asked, Alan, are you going to help us? She was, of course, treated to her distracted son's very familiar glare and shrug. Eric, on the other hand, was growing even more excited and smiled. Even if his mother didn't quite believe him, he had faith that Yulnir would come through and have some decorations for him tomorrow. It wasn't that long ago that he ran into the strange man in the woods, and now he was putting a lot of trust in him to come through. Oh, boys, you know that phone call I took earlier? That was my boss, Susan. And do you know that? Uh, and do you know the New Year's party we normally have in the big city? Well, the venue called us, and they had a freak water pipe break, so we needed a new place to have the party, Patricia droned on. Wait, did you? Alan started with his annoyed tone. Yes, I did. We are having the New, Year Eve, new Year's Eve party here. Absolutely everywhere is booked, and we're the only ones with to have a bit, place big enough for everyone. Eric was not particularly excited to see his mother's co-workers either. They were all very young and very city, always with the newest fashion, keeping up with the latest trends, just like his mother. Try to do, try to do in order to keep up with the much younger colleagues. Mom, does this mean you have to cook? Eric said quietly. Yes, yes, I'm going to try to cook. Normally I would say order pizza, but that's just not in, in right now, came her, uh, her reply. Patricia used to be the cook for the family, but only when, when her husband, Robert, was there with her. He was always the one wanting to try new recipes and made old family classics. Don't worry, I will practice and it'll be perfectly fine, Patricia reassured the boys. Then lights of the house and television came back on, shocking the family for a moment. Alan jumped up first, grabbing all of his things and marching back upstairs without so much as a good night. Patricia slowly stood up and said, Eric, I hope you never become a teenager. It'll be too quiet in this house if you become one. She started to grab her things and noticed that Eric wasn't moving. Honey, don't you want to go up to your bed too? If it's okay, I think I just want to sleep down here next to the fire, Alec replied, looking to, uh, looking into the flames around the Yule log. That'll be fine, but if the fire does die down, come upstairs and stay warm. She gave uh, came over to Eric and gave him a kiss uh, on the head and a smile. Thank you for building us a fire tonight, Eric, and I do hope you find us some decorations. It was good to have all of us in the same room for so long. In this rare moment, Eric saw his mother for who she was years ago. It was beginning ra becoming rarer the more she got involved with her work, but in these rare moments, everything was okay. Love you, Mom, he said, trying to hold in the moment. I love you too, Eric, she said as she pulled away and turned off the lights and television, heading up to, re heading up to bed herself. As he listened to his mother's footsteps, footsteps disappear up the stairs, Eric focused his gaze on the fire burning at the edge of the makeshift couch bed. Not only had the flames burned all night, but it hadn't appeared to shrink. But it hadn't appeared to shrink the Yule log at all. 
As Eric began to close his eyes, he could uh, have sworn the flames got a little bigger. And just as the clouds of deep sleep were over the edge of his eyes, there was a moment that he thought he saw the face of his father dancing in the flames. The bright light of the morning sun reflected off fresh snow. The bright light of the morning snow reflecting off fresh snow awoke Eric on Sunday, the 20th of December. The Yule log was burning in the family's fireplace. Memories of yesterday's meeting with his mysterious Yule near and his wife, Holly, flooded young Eric's mind. His mother and brother were still asleep above him, so he slipped out to make his makeshift couch bed to greet the new day and cold hardwood floor. What happened yesterday, he said to himself as he slipped on his house shoes. Eric hurried to the kitchen to find something to eat before completing his task in the forest. For now, the house was quiet, which gave Eric the time he needed to recall the events of yesterday. He found himself questioning everything going circles in his mind. Luckily, he had a remedy and a way to continue the story. This morning, he needed to go out and see if Yulnir kept his word and help find decorations for their home. So he quickly finished his crispy cereal, drank the chocolatey milk in the bowl, and readied his winter clothes. When he got outside the mudroom, he was greeted by fresh powdered snow from last night. Nearly half a foot of snow had fallen in the back house's backyard and into the forest beyond. It was occurring to Eric now, as he trudged through the fresh powder, that Yulnir never told him how to contact him today, or what he should be looking for. Luckily, the morning sun was already slightly warming up the cold morning as Eric crossed into the tree line. He continued into the forest, retracing his steps from the previous night. He couldn't seem to find where the fire had been. Hey, Yulnir, I'm here. You said you would help today, Eric called into the forest, and the forest said nothing back. Come on, I really need those decorations. The forest only echoed the, uh, in his words in return. Old man, where are you? Eric said more impatient now. But this time, he did get a reply. With a slight nudge on his right cheek, he then felt the warm, slimy texture of a tongue run up, run up his face. Eric lurched back at the sensation of mysterious saliva on the side of his face. His eyes turned right to see standing before him what seemed like a large deer. Eric surveyed the surprise animal from antler to hoof. And he still couldn't place what it was. It was the it was the it was larger than the biggest deer, but smaller than a moose. What are you? Some kind of moose deer hybrid? What kind of joke is this, Yulnir? Wait, Santa Claus, Santa Claus, and his reindeer. Sure enough, before Eric was an actual reindeer, fur slightly white, mature face, nothing unordinary besides the deep blue's eyes that looked back and looked straight into Eric's own. After a long staring contest, the reindeer won. Eric looked behind the large hybrid moose, deer, and noticed it was connected to some kind of sleigh. A sleigh full of boxes and bins of winter decorations. Never mind. Thank you, Eric shouted as if Yulnir was listening. He then began to inspect the decorations and realized that they weren't just any decorations, but the decorations that his family used to have. Eric couldn't believe his eyes. There it all was. The memories of not only Christmases of years past, but also memories of his father. The ornaments, stockings, scented pine cones, red and green bows, gold tassel, and even festive glasses and flatware handed down to him from, from his father to son for generations. His emotions took him. He fell to his knees and began to cry over the sleigh of his long lost memories. Last evening, he felt the warmth of his father, and now he felt the void that had been left behind in his absence. The reindeer turned its head so only its left eye was visible, watching Eric, like it understood. Erp! May <laughs> I don't know how I'm gonna do this voice. I think I'm going with her. Came of noise from the reindeer as it attempted to get Eric's attention. It was unsuccessful as Eric still wept at his coat. Came another, and then a and rapid succession, which was successful in getting Eric to look up to the reindeer's noisy mouth. What? Can't you see I'm going through something here? He protested to the majestic creature. The reindeer replied, nodding its head slowly up and down, clearly understanding Eric. You can understand me, Eric said in a confused shock. The reindeer answered with a slight tilt of its head, as if it was struggling its, its shrugging its large shoulders. This managed to give Eric the will to stand up and wipe away the tears from his face. When he looked back up to the single dark blue eye, which looked right back at him still, it then let out another erp, erp, while gesturing to its back. Eric turned to his head and saw the reindeer had a saddle made of beautiful brown leather, etched in fantastical designs. He walked over and placed his gloved hand on the aged leather. Aged leather. Erp, erp. Do you want me to get on? Eric asked towards the reindeer's head. Erp, came the response. Eric had ridden the horse once. Eric had ridden a horse once when he was four and could barely remember it. Even if he could, his legs were not even that long enough to actually ride properly. 
But this reindeer was a little bit smaller than a horse, and stepping up into the stirrups was possible for Eric's short legs. So he placed one foot inside the loop and hoisted his body up. As soon as one leg came over the, uh, the other side, his whole body, uh, body went with it, sliding a little too far. Luckily, his foot, his foot that was holstered caught him in the order to save the rest of his body from tumbling over the other side. He regained his composure and settled into his new reindeer mobile. Okay, Eric, listen to me. You are riding a reindeer right now who was sent by a mysterious old man you met last night. You might be crazy, Eric told himself out loud as he was trying to make everything more real than it already was. He looked down to the reins of the reindeer, took them in his hand, and raised them high in the air and shouted, Mush! The reindeer turned its head back towards Eric and gave him an extremely annoyed side eye, along with a very low, er, clearly showing his displeasure and being mushed. Oh, sorry, Mr. Reindeer, Eric questioned towards the reindeer as he actually didn't know if it was a miss or a mister. He received a reassuring, the, 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 that read as a yes, he was a mister. Okay then, Mr. Reindeer, what now? Can, I can't get these decorations back home on my own. Can, can you take me? With that, the reindeer began to walk, startling Eric, who was not positioned correctly. Onward, shouted Eric while he pointed to the direction of his home. Only moments ago, Eric was crying for his father's absence, and now he was on top of the world, riding a reindeer. So white-coated reindeer, blue-coated boy, and red-wooded sleigh marched through the pine forest with a snowy, beautiful snowy morning to bring back the joy of the season to a family much in need of some magic. Meanwhile, on this snowy morning, Patricia was waking up. Oh, I hit that was a coffee pause. Coffee pause. Okay. <clears throat> Meanwhile, on this snowing morning, Patricia was waking up from a deep sleep that she had much ne was in much need of. She turned her head to see the clock state it was 10.41 a.m., and the house was quiet, which usually meant the worst as the boys were not up to any good, or at best, they were still asleep. She let out a yawn, stretched, his ar stretched her arms, let her feet slide into her slippers, and got a start to her day. And like clockwork, her mind began to play the day. First thing, get the boys up. Get some breakfast, coffee, shower, grocery store, crap, snow. Okay, check how the roads are. Then check emails. Oh, and Eric wants to decorate today. Well, we don't have much to store uh, stored away since we took the decoration down since Robert's sister's house in Ohio, so take care of that. I need a white wrap presents. Call Susan. Finish the plans for the party. Oh, and on, on and on her mind went. The moment it got started, it did not stop until she went to sleep. Only if she was lucky. Often her nights were restless, an endless series of thoughts and analytics from her job. Likes, comments, algorithms, trends. Taking care of the boys while climbing this modern social ladder was taxing for her. She only hoped the boys were not lost in all of this. Alan, he was so trapped in his own world now, just like the video games, but in every way. She thought as she let out a sigh, she walked down the hall to the boys' rooms. She knocked on his door and peered in. Alan, honey, are you awake? Her head now peeping through the crack. You never know what's going to be happening in a teenage boy's room after all. And her teenage boy was already awake on his phone, endlessly scrolling on the phone screen. Morning, Mom. I've been up for a while. Breakfast, he said to her faintly. Uh, yes, I think I can scrounge something up. Need to practice for the party tonight, she said, trying not put, she said, trying to put excitement in her words. All right, let me shower and I will come down. All right, let me shower and I will come down. Need to be more annoyed, teenager. Alan put down his phone and started to move. Patricia smiled and edged out of the doorway, a success. Now on to her other son. Eric, my sweet boy, he was such a good heart. Last night he built the fire. He is coming more and more like his father every day. A thought that both filled her with love and sadness. She reached his bedroom and knocked on the door, edging in a little less cautiously as Eric wasn't a teenager yet. Eric, honey, time to get up. Time to get the day started, she said. Yet there was no Eric to be seen. It was then she remembered that Eric slept downstairs next to the fire. She took a second to look around his boy room, his her boy's room. It was as clean as it ever was. For a 12-year-old boy, Eric was incredibly tidy. After a moment, she had made her head exit down... After a moment, she made her exit to head downstairs to conjure up some breakfast. Heading down the stairs, Patricia turned her head towards the couch, expecting to see a sleeping Eric, but instead treated to an empty nest of blankets on the couch. It was then she also remembered Eric had planned to go get some decorations for today. One boy living in a digital fancy, the other living in a fantasy in the real world. I should enjoy it, though. Eric will soon be a teenager himself and the house will become even more lonely. She let out a smile and worked her way to the kitchen. The problem was the party was the, uh, the week after next. The right now, the kitchen was pretty empty. She opened the fridge to inspect the egg situation, the foundation of any breakfast. What was revealed to her was three eggs, half a pack of pre-cooked sausages, and some milk. 
The inspection continued into the pantry to find a half a loaf of bread and some bananas. Patricia let out uh, let out this filter through her mind. Patricia let all of this filter through her mind without while formulating a plan. A glare over the bottle of syrup put it all together. French toast, she said out loud. It was a simple recipe anyone could make, and she made it a lot with the boys when they were younger. Can't be hard. You've done this before. Just need some spices, the eggs beaten together. So you'll need a bowl, a whisk. Her thoughts continue while she collected all the necessary components. She assembled them on the counter space designated for prep. Her husband had de uh, designed the kitchen so that the window looked over the backyard. Okay, focus, Patricia. Eggs beaten, milk added, cinnamon, then turn the stove on. She completed the task in that order, and it was then she looked outside the window and saw the mo uh, amount of snow that had fallen the previous night. That's more than I thought. I'm going to start a need uh, a left. That's more than I thought. Going to need a store might be harder than I anticipated. Back to cooking. That will come later. She pulled out the sausage and got it heating in a skillet long, uh, along with a pan to make the French toast. Her eyes were focusing on the mixing of the ba uh, batter, and then she noticed something moving outside that made her glance up. Add bread to butter, then cooked on flat skillet brown. Oh wow, it's actually beautiful outside. Blue skies, now cover tree. Eric riding a reindeer. And check the sausages. And Eric is riding a reindeer! The bright morning sun blinded Eric as he and his newfound steed cleared the forest. He scanned the house for any evidence of family activity, and when his eyes came to the kitchen window, his stomach dropped. Meeting his gaze was his mother's eyes. He also saw her expression of shock and horror, seeing him on the reindeer. He watched as she ran past window after window to see the uh, to the mudroom, until she burst through the back door, half dressed in her winter clothes. For the first time in a long time, his mother was speechless. She came within ten feet of him and the reindeer and just stopped. Eric decided to be the first to break the silence. Hey, mom. Got the decorations? Her uh, wide eyes turned from her son now to the sleigh that was behind him with boxes and containers. She walked over and became more surprised that they were in fact the same totes of decorations that she had given um, year, uh, have given away years prior to the other family members. It was everything. The tree, the ornaments, the stockings. Everything. Eric, how did you find all of this? Where did you get the sleigh? Where did you get the reindeer? Her voice steadily rose as she questioned. Before Eric had a chance to reply, she asked an unexpected question. Are you fine with French toast for breakfast? Alan was getting out of bed and headed down, uh, downstairs, phone in hand. He could smell sausage and cinnamon as he got close to the kitchen. The first thing he saw as he rounded the corner was Eric with his biggest grin on his face. Good morning, brother. Have a seat. Mom made breakfast. Eric pulled out a chair for his brother. He then handed him a red Santa hat, one of which he was, he was already wearing. Alan sensed something was off when he looked at his mom, who was glaring out the kitchen window, sipping her cup of coffee, eyes wide as saucers. Hey, mom, breakfast smells great. You okay? Alan asked. Yes, everything's fine. I decided to practice cooking it again and made some French toast. And then your brother found a reindeer with her old Christmas decorations. Isn't that great? Her coffee hand was slightly shaking with the craziness of the situation. Alan looked back over to Eric, who had a big smile on his face as he ate his French toast. He then headed over to the window to look as he, uh, as the, at the supposed reindeer. Sure enough, as he looked out, he was greeted by, uh, by the face of a reindeer gazing right into the family home. What? he exclaimed and headed towards the mudroom to check out what his brother had brought home. Alan, what are you doing? asked his mother. I'm taking a picture of it to put on Instagram. My friends will not believe this, he said as he headed out, boots half on. Eric was behind him, ready to see what happened as his brother came face to face with his new friend. When Alan got outside, he pulled out his phone and did to do a live stream of the reindeer encounter. Hey, a live stream. He began to uh, narrate the experience as he approached the large animal. Hey guys, you will not believe what my brother found. Look at it. It's a freaking reindeer. He turned the phone camera around to show the antlered creature sniffing the air with a few within a few feet of him. It let out an erp as it tried to lick the camera lens. Hey, man, watch out for the camera. I don't want you to slobber on it. The reindeer did not listen to this request as he continued to lick towards the camera. After a few attempts, he managed a long lick from Alan's finger to the top of the camera. He then decided to nibble the top of the phone and grabbed it from Alan's hands. Get back my phone, all right? Before he finished the sentence, the phone was already disappearing into the reindeer's mouth, his live stream still going as it engulfed it as a morning snack. Dude, what the? Eric, get my phone back, Alan said in a panic. Alan, your phone's gone, man. That's not coming back, Eric replied in laughter. To watch his brother lose his precious phone in such a way was pure gold in him. This is hilarious. Where were, were you still streaming? I think so. So your followers are still watching right now. 
Oh, shh. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> it's about to be. It's about to be, Eric returned in full laughter. <laughs> I forgot I had it then. At the situation, Alan shoved past him and ran into the house to find his mom uh, and her Instagram account. Eric looked at his phone, eating uh, his phone eating companion, and gave him a slight nod before chasing Alan to observe the unfolding situation. As the boys entered the kitchen, they could hear their mother on the phone. Yes, hey, it's uh, it's Patricia. Can you check and see if you have the Christmas decorations I gave you? Yes, Roberts. Uh huh. You still have them? Oh, they're up. They're up right now. Oh, everything's okay. Just something strange happened. Okay, I need to let the boys... The boys just came back in. Okay, bye-bye. What is it, Alan? Mom, Mom, you gotta check my Instagram. Eric's dumb pet just ate my phone. Go to Instagram quick. Alan sputtered with a great uh, agitation. His mother pulled up her Instagram and searched Alan's account. Sure enough, there was a live stream. His video was mostly dark, but now had over 500 viewers, all now observing the digestion process of a reindeer. Oh, look, honey, you have a lot of views. I don't have the views. Eric's dumb moose has the views, Alan argued. Actually, it's a reindeer, and it's pretty cool. He just doesn't seem to like phones, even though he was about, uh, you, uh, even though he was about to be very popular. Look at that, almost 700 views now, Alan, Eric interjected. I'm going to be the laughing stock of the school when I get back, Mom. I won't have a phone, and I'll be the guy who lives through the creation of a reindeer shit, Alan said, shaking with both rage and fear. Alan, watch your mouth. I'll get you a new phone, but look, it's not that bad. You have all of winter break for people to laugh and forget about this. By the time you're back in school, they have already moved on to the next kid who had their phone swallowed by a polar bear or something. Mom, why are you mad at me when Eric brought home a strain moose reindeer? Alan returned. I will handle Eric, but first, let's finish breakfast. I'm sure the reindeer will cause no more problems, will not cause any more harm until after we finished. His mother said, playing the peacemaker. Alan did not seem to like this answer as he stormed upstairs to his room, more than likely to check his laptop and keep track of this unexpected uh, internet, his unexpected internet infamy. Patricia let a large sigh and moved over to the dining table in the corner of the kitchen, motioning for Eric to do the same. Are you okay? His he asked his, oh, <laughs> I read that as Patricia. Are you okay? He asked his mother. Eric, I'm not handling it well. I don't know what in the world is going on. Reindeer, our old decorations, your brother's phone being swallowed. How is a mother supposed to react to all this? Who is a mother to call about their son bringing home a wild animal without being laughed at on the phone? Eric, I just don't know. Which is why all I want to do is eat my breakfast until I figure out what to do. And with that, she began to cut into her French toast and enjoy her morning as if nothing had happened. Eric followed his mother's example and did the same. The rest of their meal they ate in silence, both of them looking towards the kitchen window as the reindeer looked back at them. After breakfast, Eric decided to go and smooth things over to his brother, but found his door locked and with no answer to his knocks. He also assumed his mother would soon come to her senses and try to find a way to get rid of his new companion. So it was best to move fast and distract her, so he donned his winter clothes once again, happily marched past his mother, who was cleaning up the kitchen, then went outside into the snow-covered world, he was happily greeted with a snort and a familiar, Hey, so my mom is totally not going to let me keep you, but I do think she will love the decorations. Let's go ahead and bring them around the to the garage so we can unload them all before she makes any calls. The reindeer naturally seemed to understand him and began to head in the direction of the garage and his parcels in tow. When Eric began to unload the sleigh, it gave him a chance to inspect everything that was there. Everything had a fresh coating of snow on it, but otherwise looked brand new. He went, back, he went to pick up the family's fake tree from the sleigh and realized by its weight that it was in fact a real tree. It looked as though it was cut down this morning. Eric was going to need help lifting it into the house, which means it was time to ask Mom. So he rolled up his sleeves, fixed his hat, and walked in confidence back inside. His mother was already on the phone with somebody. He could tell from the voice down the hall. As he got close, he began to hear the words. Yes, is this animal control? Yes, my son brought home a wild animal and I need help. No, it's, it's not a raccoon. No, it's not a coyote, Pop. He brought home a reindeer. Yes, I know they're not common in the States. No, this is not a holiday prank. My son rode a reindeer to the house this morning. Hello? Hello? Eric could tell they hung up as he came around the corner to see his mother's frustrated face and her hand drop her phone on the counter. Trying his luck, Eric thought a joke would break the ice. So uh, I guess we'll need to go pick up some reindeer food then? He could tell this joke did not go over well by the immediate mom glare that he that was cast his way. Eric, 
What are we going to do? His mother asked in defeat. Well, we could start with putting up a real tree in the living room, Eric returned with a toothy smile. Real tree? Yeah, come with me, Mom. Eric grabbed her hand and led her to the garage. She managed to get some slippers on before reaching the concrete floor and laying eyes on the sleigh in her garage. So this was also the first time Patricia really had a chance to inspect the sleigh's contents for herself. There it all was. Eric and Alan's first decorations they had as babies. Robert's baby ornament. The first ornament set they, uh, set they bought as a young couple. Even the ornament that she broke when Robert died. Then there were the decorations that came from her marrying to Robert's family. All the traditional red and green gold decorations for the house. Then she saw something that she thought she would never see again. Two cute reindeer plushies of a man and a woman wearing sweaters and holding hands. This brought her such painful and warm memories. It was the first gift that Robert had gotten her for Christmas. The only decoration she really cared about. The one that she thought she had lost forever. Eric saw his mom begin to cry. So he wrapped his arms around her. They both cried together in the garage thinking about a man who meant the world to them both. Meanwhile, in his upstairs room, Alan was watching the live feed of his phone moving around the darkness of a reindeer's digestive system, now with over 6,000 viewers, all surely, uh, surely from his school. I'm going to kill Eric, he yelled to the corner of his room. His brother might be smaller or younger than him, but in his mind, Alan could only see red. He clenched his fist and slammed his door open, ready to give Eric a piece of his mind. When he got downstairs, his brother and mother were nowhere to be seen. Then he saw a pile of sleigh-decorated Slade dip gifted decorations in the corner of his room, of the living room where they used to put the tree. He heard the door to the garage close. Rushing over, fists still clenched, he was ready to start screaming match with Eric. He twisted the door handle and swung it open to see his brother, his mother, and the reindeer all gathered around the sleigh in the garage. Alan opened his mouth, ready to launch into a frenzy. Eric, I'm going, oh sweetie, take these. He was cut off by his mother, who handled, handed him a stack of stockings from the fireplace mantle. Go ahead and hang these up in the living room. Can you believe what we have them again? Alan opened his mouth again and raised a hand to try to get a word in. Then he was cut off by Eric. Hey, Alan, look at this. It was a plate we used to set cookies on for Santa. And even the cup we used for milk. How cool is this? Eric, we have to talk about this reindeer and the fact that he has ruined my life. Alan, we'll get you a new phone after New Year's. Now hurry up and help us, answered his mother. With that, Eric and Patricia rushed past Alan and into the house like a couple of happy elves, leaving Alan alone in the garage with a reindeer who twisted a little twisted a little bit and let out an erp, and as to say that he was sorry. The family spent the remainder of the day decorating the house together, Eric and Patricia reliving the happiest of memories as they worked. By the end of the evening, they had the entire house completely covered in the decorations. They went to the nearest pet store and purchased the six biggest bags of dog food they could find. It appeared that Eric's reindeer has now been welcomed into the family. When they returned home, Alan asked to watch a Christmas movie together. So they all watched A Christmas Story. As the evening came to a close, Eric looked, at the, Eric looked at the Yule log to see it fully ablaze in the fireplace, illuminating the entire house with a red glow of warmth and love. Over the course of the next few days, the family continued to grow closer over the freshly decorated house. Eric was happy that every night he, he would ask to watch another Christmas movie, and no one argued with him. Even Alan seemed to be spending more time with the family. Although Eric couldn't tell if it was out of love or if it was to avoid his new viral embarrassment on social media, as a live stream, the inside of the reindeer was now hitting over a million views. Their mother seemed to be returning to who she was in years past. She fussed over the decorations, cooked breakfast every morning, and made time for the boys every evening after working from home. All while the Yule log continued to grow bright and strong throughout the week at least until the events of Christmas Eve. Patricia star uh, stared across the table at her two sons, reading their faces as they took apart the most recent experiment, butter chicken and vegetable curry. Well, Mom, it's certainly authentic, maybe a little spicy, but good, I, I, I promise it's good, Eric managed to get out. This answer seemed to satisfy her. She gave, gave a smile and then turned towards Alan, who had just finished the second bite of the brown substance. At first, he seemed to struggle with words, and then it seemed he was struggling with the heat, where he finally swallowed his bite of eggplant and chicken. Well, what about you, Alan? What do you think? His mother requested. Alan first glared at Eric as if he was having a telepathic conversation about what he would say. He saw in Eric's eyes that he should keep their mother happy rather than to tell her the truth. I'm with Eric. It's good. Just a little spicy. This once again seemed to please his mother, and once again, Alex, uh, Alan looked in Eric in distress. They both were being subjected to nightly experiments of cooking for their upcoming New Year's Eve party. 
pad thai, shepherd's pie, quinoa salads, and even some African dishes that still live on in memories of the boys' stomachs. All dishes that their mother thought her uh, diverse and hip mix of colleagues would enjoy. Mom, what do you think? Why do you have to make all these really complicated dishes? Alan questioned. Well, I guess I really want to impress them. I want to be able to have these parties more often, she replied. Yeah, that's great, Mom. We'd love to see you cook. But why don't you cook something a little easier? You're going to go crazy trying to make all these dishes in a week, Eric added. What if we help you cook something easier next Wednesday, Alan offered generously. Patricia leaned back in her chair to think. You know what, Alan? It would be really nice of you boys to help. Why don't we start tonight? She said with a mischievous smile while looking over her shoulder at the mountain of dishes from tonight's dinner. Oh, I, I think I forgot to feed Buddy. I gotta, do a good, gotta go do that, Alan. Can you help tonight since it was his idea? And what seemed like a second, Eric had already put on his coat and headed outside, leaving Alan open mouth and realized he now had his, uh, was now stuck cleaning the sticky Indian mess all on the pots and plates. Eric had decided to name the reindeer Buddy after the family watched the movie Elf after a night of decorating. It felt fitting because the movie Buddy was a very free spirit who didn't quite fit in with the modern world, which their newest family reindeer was very akin to, as he didn't really seem to uh, like technology. Anytime Alan would come around with a gaming device, his new phone, or his laptop, Buddy, his reindeer, Buddy the reindeer always tried to eat them. Buddy, who had also taken to eating an entire bag of dog food every night, while his uh, mother was annoyed at this, the pet store. Uh, while his mother was annoyed at going to the pet store this past week, Eric enjoyed his evenings with Buddy. During the day, Buddy would hang around the house, looking in on the family through the, all the windows of their home. But during the night, he would return to the forest and always return for breakfast the next morning. Eric would tell Buddy of his day and how and how his brother and mother were doing. He would also keep him up to date on the Yule log and how it was burning. As he suspected, Buddy was keeping. As he suspected, Buddy was keeping Yulnir up to, ta uh, up to date on what was happening. Or at least, he hoped he was. Oh, Buddy, I can't believe how great it is to have the magic back. I missed it so much, without even knowing it. Alan and I are slowly coming together, and Mom is excited just to be herself. Her cooking could still use some work, though. Buddy looked up to see the bag of dog food to give a reassuring nod, indicating that he was listening. Another big thing tonight is Christmas Eve, which means it's time to give presents out. I know some people wait till Christmas Day, but we really don't care about that. Honestly, we can't wait to see. I can't wait to see what Holly gave me as presents from Mom and Alan. Eric reached out to pet uh, Buddy between his antlers, and when he heard the door open for the house, Eric, don't you think we're? Go Eric, don't think you're getting away from doing all the dishes. I know it doesn't take that long to feed him. Get in here. Afterwards, we'll start opening presents. His mother shouted. Well, you heard her. It's time. I hope you had a good night, buddy, and tell you near that I'm so happy and I'm, do I'm doing my best, he said with a wink. Eric then turned to his mother, standing at the doorway. Coming, Mom. After helping Alan finish his dishes, the family came together around the roaring fireplace near the tree. Each of them was wearing Christmassy clothes, something they hadn't done since Robert had passed. In this moment, it felt if he was right there with them. Now, Alan, why don't you start us off, Patricia said. Each of them had a small pile of presents to open. The boys having more than his mother, the boys having more than their mother, of course. Alan opened the ones he suspected were video games, and they worked. When it came to Eric's presents, he mostly got close as he was starting to grow more at his age. So he had a couple of pairs of pajamas, a new sweater, some t-shirts, and socks. He also got some stuff to draw with, as well as a new journal that he could both write and sketch in. Then came their mother's gift, who had two, one from Alan and one from Eric. She started with Alan's, which was pretty simple but nice. Chocolates with some soaps and natural cosmetics store at the mall. Thank you, Alan. These are very thoughtful. What more can a mother ask for? She said with a warm smile. Now, Eric, let us see what you were so busy getting the other day. It's very soft. I wonder what it could be. Eric smiled as she began to work her way through the beautiful packaging that Holly made uh, for her gift. His mother smiled as she felt the softness of the blanket. Oh, Eric, it's so nice. And then the darkness came across the warmth in the room. Eric, she said with much seriousness, where did you get this? He gulped. From the kind woman at the mall in the Yuletide and Holly store. Now this blanket was fully visible in the firelight, and so was his mother's distressed face. Eric, if this is a joke, it's not funny. Do you not recognize this blanket? As Holly was floating around the store a few days ago, Eric never had time to really inspect what she was grabbing as a gift. He was leaning in to see the red and brown woven blanket. 
It did look familiar. Where have I seen this blanket before? He thought to himself. And then it hit him like a long hidden away sadness that he never wanted to feel again. This was the blanket that was always on, was always on his parents' beds when his father was alive. The blanket he played on every Christmas morning. The blanket that his grandmother had made, the, made for his parents when they first got married. And the same blanket that his father was buried in seven years ago. Mom, I don't, I, I can't, I, I swear, I just bought it from the store the other day. Patricia held the blanket close to her chest and buried her face in it so, uh, face in it so her tears soaked into the warm fabrics. The fire of the Yule log grew for a minute and began to slowly fade. This most of all frightened Eric. The family sat in silence for what seemed like an eternity. Finally, Patricia spoke. You have to be right, Eric. It must be a similar blanket you found. Alan, please... Open your present from Eric. Please change this mood. She tried her best to soak up her tears and appear strong for the boys. Alan now fe uh, feared what gift was waiting for him in the perfectly wrapped packaging. He reluctantly reached down to and untie the bow and began to tear into the wrapping. It was not long before his face was covered in the same darkness that his recently covered in uh, same darkness that had recently covered his mother's. What came next was not the same as the mother's sadness. Instead, he was filled with anger. Where did you get this, Eric? Tell me right now. Eric crawled a few steps back from the rage of his brother. I I'm sorry, I don't know. It, it was the same place I got Mom's. I, I didn't see what it was really. The torn packaging revealed this long, confusing word that Holly had taught Eric. Neffeltoffel. Dad was teaching me this right before. Before. Alan's rage was mixing with tears in his eyes. Once again, the fire around the Yule Law grew and began to die down. But Patricia looked up to see the board game. He was teaching you that? He never told me. I knew he played with his father. Well, he's dead now. In this game, that blanket and all this holiday crap died with him. I'm done with this. With that, Eric tossed his gift into the dying fire and ran upstairs. Eric managed to grab it before anything more than the wrapping paper got burned. With Alan's fading footsteps angrily rushing up the stairs and then slamming at the door that followed, the room was left in silence. Patricia was still sat lost away in sadness and memories. The firelight was significantly less than the first uh, when they first sat down. Mom, I, I'm so sorry. I, I had no idea, I swear, Eric said, looking at the floor. I know, dear. I'm sorry about your brother. Anything about your father just really hurts him. Thank you for trying this year, dear, but maybe it's just too soon. Patricia got up and placed the blanket on the couch and made her way to the stairs as well. Eric, I love you. Good night, she said with a weak voice. With that, Eric was truly alone in a room full of decor uh, discarded presents and their wrappings, a dying fire, the only the faint memory is his father wo uh, whom he missed more than anything else. When Eric awoke the next morning, he came down to the decorations being taken down by both his mother and his brother. What are you guys doing? Eric inquired. Well, honey, we had our fun last night. It's time to take down the decorations, said his mom, still drained from the events of last night. Just as Alan was moving over to start taking decorations off the tree, Eric bleated. Please, can we leave the tree up at least until New Year's Eve party? It would be great to have something for the from the holidays for your co-workers. Right, Mom? Patricia sat with, sat with the thought for a moment and eventually nodded her head and then looked towards Alan to show that she agreed. Alan, who was giving Eric a very cold shoulder, grabbed a box to take, uh, take him to the garage. I hope this is enough to keep the fire going just a little longer while I try to figure out what to do tonight. Uh, tonight I have to talk to Yulnir again, Eric thought to himself, but first he needed to get a message to the man. Hey mom, I'm going to get go feed Buddy if that's okay. Fine, just be in to get some cereal and toast. Then have to, then we have to help us take the stuff down, his mom sighed as she said it. Eric went back downstairs and put on enough clothes to go out into the snow-covered yard. Just as he had done the last few days, he called out to the forest for his friends. It only took, for his friend, it only took a few seconds for Buddy to come out of the tree line and greet Eric with a happy, erp. Right away, Buddy could tell something was different today. Eric handed over the bag of dog food and pet do, uh, Buddy's side as he ate. Hey, last night was uh, really bad, and I'm really worried about the fire and the Yule log. Buddy stopped eating and looked Eric in the eyes. I need help, and I don't know what to do. I only have six more days to the New Year's Eve party and six more days to keep the fire alive. And now it's lower and lower than ever. I need to talk with Mr. Yulnir. Can you go tell him that I need to see him? Eric asked. Buddy looked down at his food, back up to Eric, and then into the forest. His expression was sad. But when he looked back at Eric, he gave the biggest and uh, wettest reindeer lick. 
Ew, gross. You smell like dog food. With that, Buddy started walking towards the forest line again on a mission. But And right before he disappeared, he looked back one more time towards Eric. For a moment, they looked at each other in true, true friendship, and then he was gone. The rest of the day was spent taking down the decorations and getting the house cleaned up for the gift uh, from the gift opening last night. Alan took his new game and disappeared quickly into the room uh, room away from everyone else. Patricia seemed distant and she took her uh, to her room early, although it did appear that she took the blanket with her. This led Eric to, uh, left Eric to his own thoughts, which only made him time go slower. Eric did find some peace in his new journal. While he didn't feel like writing, he, drew, uh, he did draw a picture of Buddy on the front pages. Dinner that night was leftovers of butter chicken and vegetarian curry, which even their mother had to agree was less than edible. They planned to go down into town tomorrow to get supplies for the week and for the coming dinner party. By the time the dinner was over and the sun had set, Eric asked once again to be excused to go feed Buddy. In reality, he was hoping to find the answer, his answer from Yulnir. Mom, I, I know it's dark outside, but I think I want to be alone in the woods for a while tonight. I won't go far, I promise, Eric asked. Fine, but take a flashlight and keep it on you so I can see you. And no riding that reindeer. It's not safe, she scolded. This was acceptable to Eric, and he took off for his nightly ritual in his winter clothes. And now, with a flashlight, he could see, uh, seen, be seen from far away. He did grab the last bag of dog food from the mud room uh, before heading out for the trees. Buddy, come here. It's dinner, called Eric, although this time there was no uh, sound to be heard, no erp and no rustling in the trees. It was a clear night. The moon cast a little light, but would not be uh, full until the New Year's. Buddy, where are you? shouted a now more worried Eric. Still nothing. Eric uh, began to head towards the tree line, calling several more times to no response. He reached the spot where he always met Buddy and saw nothing but the remains of discarded dog food. Where is he? Eric then sat down in the snow next to a tree and waited. For over ten minutes he waited and there was no sign of his four-legged friend. Beginning to tear up um, from the, at the reality of being abandoned, he went to call out one more time. Buddy, where are... Before he could finish the question, he was swiftly, swiftly grabbed from behind and was slung into the air before he knew it. He landed on the hard back of Buddy, who was galloping at full speed through the forest. There you are. I was worried. Err, came the happy and wind-covered reply. Eric reached down to hug Buddy's neck, both out of love but also out of survival. He was traveling at incredible speeds. The forest was rushing by, and as soon as he knew that he was much further than he had been before. In fact, he had no idea where he was as the forest was becoming fields and valleys. Suddenly to his left, Eric could see the faint glow of headlights on a road. Hey, buddy, where are we going? Did you tell Yulnir? Should we be out this far? He did not receive an answer, but could, uh, but could see where they, were, where they were heading. And the distance glow was a large city, Milwaukee. And as the glow of the city became clearer, so did the roads and the houses on their way. Should we keep going this way? People around here are not used to reindeer on the roads, buddy. Ahead of them was a busy, busy interstate with many cars driving on both sides. Just as Buddy reached the road, Eric closed his, eye to prepare for, closed his eyes to prepare for impact. The wind was rushing through Eric's hair, and he felt more weightless than normal. And then he opened his eyes. He could see he was, not, uh, above the inter he was now above the interstate, and that Buddy was now galloping across the sky. Why didn't you tell me you could fly sooner? He could have done, we could have done so much more, Eric said with excitement and joy. Erp, came the reply from Buddy, as if to say, you never asked. It did not take long for the duo to reach the outskirts of Milwaukee, and it was then that Eric realized their true destination, Yuletide and Holly. The parking lot was empty for the mall, as it was Christmas Day, and the sun had already set. As they approached, they were able to land right in front of the entrance closest to Yuletide and Holly. As Buddy returned to solid ground, Eric began to slide off delirious from the flight. As Buddy caught him, uh, caught him with his mouth and gently placed him on the pavement. Eric managed to find his balance once again and adjusted it to his surroundings and adjusted to his surroundings. Okay, we are here. Now, how do I get in? He asked Buddy, who then looked in the direction of the sliding glass door to the mall, which was wide open. Ah, well, great. Let's go. As Eric went to head inside, Buddy stayed and motioned for him to continue on his own. Okay, well, I hope you're still here when I get back and don't get a parking ticket, joked Eric. With that, he walked through the open doors of the shopping mall, easily finding his destination, as it was the only, illum uh, the only illuminated store inside. And not just any lights, but candlelight burning bright from what seemed uh, like a thousand wicker flames dancing in the store windows. When Eric was, uh, there last, was here last time, he was not aware how magical Yuletide and Holly appeared. Compared to the commercial spaces next to it, the store looked as though it was from another world. 
Eric walked through the wooden door of Holly's store to find her set, sitting by a fireplace of her own, rocking in a chair. Her hair was cascading down her back, and she was now no longer wearing clothes that made her look like a grandmother. She now looked like she was part of the store. Holly branches extended from the back of her head like a crown. Her aged eyes now resembled falcons as she surveyed the room to find Eric standing there, a little shaken from his flight. I am so glad to see you, my dear boy. Her voice was still warm and nurturing despite her changed appearance. Hello, Mrs. Holly. It's good to see you. Did Buddy give you my mes give my message to Yulnir? Eric asked with a shaking voice. From behind him, he heard a familiar voice. Buddy, you named the greatest of reindeer, Buddy. Eric to see what uh, see that it was Yulnir coming from another room in the store, and th uh, that was not there last time. Yulnir, I'm so glad I, uh, so glad you heard that I needed your help. Everything has gone wrong so fast. The Yule log is almost dead. My brother hates me and my mom is so sad. Eric let it all out. Yulnir got down on one knee and hugged Eric. His appearance was also different now. He wore a fur cloak and he looked less like Santa Claus and more like a wizard. Yulnir then stood back up and looked back down at Eric. No hero's journey is ever easy, my dear boy. There must be a struggle in order to grow into what you're destined to be, he said with a magical twinkle in his eye. But Mr. Yulnir, how do I fix this? I can't do this on my own. I need help, Eric pleaded. Eric, I have already helped you more than I should. This is your story, Yulnir replied. Helped me? How have you helped me? Eric said with confusion. Well, I did send Dinyur, I mean, Buddy, to bring you here, didn't I? He said with a wink. Now, Eric, I must be off. The hunt needs me. And to you, my dear wife, I hope you are right about this one. Remember the last time we thought I was wrong about something like this? You ended up cap captured by some crazy king, Holly said from the corner of the room as she approached Eric and Yulnir. After a thousand years, you still use this against me, Yulnir replied while reaching out to grab Holly's hand and give it a kiss. Now, I must be off. The hunt rides tonight. Eric, I will see you in six nights. With that, he grabbed a wide-brimmed hat from the wall, placed it on his head, and left the store. Ollie kneeled down and looked into Eric's eyes. How about some tea? With so many questions floating in his mind after seeing Yulnir again, Eric could do, no, no, uh, do little more than nod in response. Holly took his head, hand and led him next to the fireplace where two chairs, a small table, and two cups of warm tea were already waiting. As Eric sat down, he decided the best, uh, the, decided the best question to ask first. How old are you? What, where, what, is Buddy, what is Buddy really? How long have you been with Yulnir? Where did he go? What did he mean by the hunt? What does, why doesn't he look like Santa Claus now? Where, where did the hat come from? When did the other room get here? How did I get here? I flew today. How did I fly? Eric paused for air. And why did you give me those presents for my mom and my brother? Everything is ruined because of them. Holly took a moment to absorb all of his questions. She was just asked, and with the kindest smile, she began to answer in order. It is not polite to ask a woman her age, but I am older than your mother. Buddy is a reindeer. Yulnir and I have been together for a long time. He means the hunt, and he, uh, he means the hunt he and his friends and family partake in every winter. He has many outfits, don't you? That other room, it's always been there. You got here by flying. It was fun, wasn't it? And you flew because of magic. She then took a pause to really think about the next answer. The reason I gave you those gifts is because without them, the spell in the Yule Log will not work. Yule Log will not work. You must get your mother and brother to accept these gifts, she finished. But they won't accept them. Alan even threw his into the fire, Eric replied in despair. Both of those gifts are attached to your father. I cannot tell you how to clear things up with your mother and brother, only that it is key to keeping the flame alive. Remembering our family, especially the ones that are no longer with us, is how we keep them alive. Holly said as she took the drink, a drink of her tea. I miss my dad so much, but they never want to talk about him. It's like he never existed. Uh, he never existed to them, Eric answered, head hanging down. Holly leaned in and grabbed Eric's hand. When my son died, I thought my world had ended, but he was the most amazing person. I want him to remember for that, for, uh, I want him to remember for that, uh, what he lived for, not what he died for. And I'm sure your mother and brother will eventually see that in your father too. I think I understand, Eric said, looking back at Holly from across their teacups. 
Good. Now we must be getting we must be getting you home. It's a long reindeer by, ride back to your family, she said as she stood up and led Eric to the little door out to where Buddy was still waiting. Thank you for the tea, and I hope Yulnir comes back safe from his hunt. Tell him thank you for sending Buddy to get me, Eric asked for, of Holly as she started back down towards Buddy. Eric, Holly called out after him. One last thing. Do you know what a potluck is? Buddy flew Eric directly to the yard rather than running through the woods. The morning glow of the winter sun was on the horizon, and he had been out much later than he had thought. For Eric was not tired. He had a mission now, and it started with his mother. I still don't know when I'm, how I'm going to get Alan to accept this gift. He won't even talk to me, Eric said to Buddy as he dismounted. Eric looked up at Buddy to see him turn his head, and then Eric smelled it. Ew, Buddy, what did you just do? Did, did, you, did you just take a crap? Buddy let out a positive, and then started to move away from Eric. It is then that Eric saw what was on top of the fresh pile of Buddy's poop, his brother's phone. Well, I guess it's a good thing it's waterproof. Let's just hope that it means it's reindeer-proof, too. Eric looked around for something to grab the phone with, but settled on sacrifice one of his winter gloves to do the job. Buddy, I gotta go take care of this, but thank you. I hope this gets him to talk to me. With that, Eric headed inside, keeping Alan's phone as far away from him as, as his body as possible. He spent the next 30 minutes, minutes carefully washing the phone with soap and water to try and get the smell, uh, get to smell remotely normal. Once it was passable, he hooked, up it, uh, hooked it up to the charger in the living room. While it was powering uh, up, he would start his plan con uh, concerning his mother. First, he stopped by the Yule log to see how much flame he still had left, and it was just enough to give him hope. Don't worry, Dad. I have a plan. He whispered to the flickering flame as he walked towards his mother's bedroom. Her door was cracked enough to see her laying on the bed in the early morning glow, so he knocked on, his, uh, knocked on his way in to announce his presence. Yeah, Eric, is that you? Yeah, I'm awake. What's up? Patricia replied from her covers. I couldn't sleep anymore, and I wanted to ask you something. Eric squeaked from the edge of the bed. Yeah, I couldn't sleep either. When did you get in? I didn't hear you come inside, his mother questioned. Eric had forgotten that his night was spent in a Milwaukee mall, but luckily his mother must have been too distracted to wait up for him. Oh, it must have been too much later after you went to bed. Maybe 10 or 11? He, he lied, waiting to see if he was caught. An eternity passed as he waited for a response. Well, I'm glad you made it back safe. Now, what do you want to talk about? She finally replied, sitting up in bed and sounding more awake. Eric turned on a light and went in to sit on her bed with her. It's about the New Year's Eve party. That's not really what I expected you to say. I thought you wanted to talk about your dad, Patricia asked with confusion. I do want to talk about dad, and I had an idea for the party that I thought would really help you, Eric said with enthusiasm. Okay, let us hear it, Patricia replied with some doubt in her tone. Have you heard of a potluck, Eric replied with a smile. Alan came downstairs and into the kitchen around ten. After the previous night, he expected his mother to still be locked away in her room and Eric out doing whatever Eric did. But instead, he heard his mother talking on the phone to someone, all while Eric was eating cereal at the table. His eyes were puffing and he looked like he hadn't gone to bed since the previous night. What's going on with you both? asked Alan. His mother waved at him and continued her conversation, which he caught a, uh, caught a bit of. Yes, yes, I, I know I said I would cook, but I think it's getting too much. Yes, I know. But I think this will be a great idea for us. We will all pitch in, she continued on. And then Alan looked over to Eric to see how, uh, who was, gr looked over to Eric, was grinning with a suspicious grin. I have a surprise, big brother, he said, still smirking. After last night, I don't want anything else. He was cut off by Eric revealing a phone charging on the wall. Wait, is that, is that my phone? Yeah, it's Buddy Crap. Yes, it is. Buddy Crap, uh, he let it go this morning. But don't worry, I cleaned it off for you and got it charging, Eric said with excitement. Alan took the phone and inspected it. First, he smelled around the casing and was surprised to find the smell. It smelled normal. And then he inspected it and found that it was remarkably the same as it was when it was eaten several days ago. Well, I hope you know. I am still mad at you for last night. I know, but I want to make this up for the whole getting your phone ate by the reindeer incident, he said with an even toothier grin. Well, we aren't even yet, but... I'm, uh, but I can only imagine how, how nasty this was, and it's better, so thank you, I guess, Alan responded, which he was returned with a thumbs up from Eric. Just then, their mother came back and hung up the phone. Well, that was Susan, my boss, and as you know, and after some convincing, 
She was going, uh, she's going to, uh, going along with the change, she said with relief. What change? Alan asked. Patricia went over to Eric and hugged him. Well, you see, your brother had a great idea that everyone should cook their own dishes for the party. And that when we made, well, that way we don't have to cook everything. In the back of his mind, Alan was thinking of all the horrible dishes they had been forced to eat the past week. Oh, thank God, he accidentally said aloud. Alan realized that what he said could be seen as rude as he corrected himself and, uh, and said, Thank God this takes pressure off of you. This correction seemed to please his mother as she returned her blissful state of relief. The only question is, what will we? Well, uh, the only question is, what will we cook? We do have to me, uh, to make at least one thing for the dinner for it to be a potluck. The three of them sat in silence for a while, thinking. They passed around a few ideas like macaroni and cheese, countered with no too simple. Then what about potato salad? Shot down by we don't want to be the people that just bring potato salad too easy. After a few rounds, they were still left with nothing. Their mother seemed to have an idea and go up to her room. She came back with an old book tucked behind, close to her chest. Susan is bringing a family recipe her father used to make, so maybe we should do something that is close to us too. The book in her hands was the family recipe book passed down to Robert after his mother died. Their grandmother was second generation Norwegian and spent a lot of her younger years in Norway with extended family. This recipe book was at least 100 years old and had been added to uh, continuously after Robert's death, until Robert's death. Alan was the first to thumb through the book when it was sat down. There was a lot of recipes that were still not translated into English, a project that Robert had started. And the ones that were translated contained, uh, contained hard to find ingredients. Alan, what are you looking for? Asked Eric. Give me a minute. I remember something, just what it looked like, but not the name. The pages were flipped uh, quickly as he passed by recipes for things like glog, lutefisk, and peppercock. Each page had a picture or a crudely made drawing what the dish was. When he reached the R page, he stopped suddenly. There, Liba. I remember Grandma used to make this for us when we would go up uh, for, uh, with Dad for the holidays. I don't remember that, Eric questioned. You were too young when we went up the last time. You would have loved it. Grandma was really picky on how it was made. She was trying to uh, teach both of us when we were uh, there the last time. She kept saying that the balancing of the crispiness of the outside with the tenderness of the inside was key, that our family has always had the best ratio of crispiness to tenderness in all the states and maybe the world. Alan was extremely excited while talking about this as if he was living a good memory. The sauerkraut with it was also really important and that's what dad, well, that was dad's specialty. He always said, Patricia grabbed the book and inspected the page, which was luckily translated. Crispy pork? A sauerkraut? I don't know if my young colleagues will like this, Alan. Upon hearing this, Alan's excitement seemed to die down. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, I just remembered it being good. His mother could tell this meant something to her oldest son, so she smiled and said, Well, I think most stories around here, stores around here would have these ingredients. So I'll stop us from have uh, it will stop it will stop us from having to go into the city. So let's make it. Alan let himself crack a smile at hearing this. But I'm going to need help, Alan. You seem to know a thing or two about this. Are you up for helping your mother? Yeah, I think I can help. Replied Alan after a momentary pause. The family was quick to get ready and head uh, and headed to the local market, which had everything they were looking for to make the Reba recipe. Patricia wanted to try to make it before the party in five days, and the pork belly needed to be uh, the pork belly needed to be remarinated overnight in the fridge, so they had just one shot to try and perfect the recipe. They did not want to. Uh, they did what they could the night that night to get ready. Luckily, they had eaten lunch at the local Wendy's and only needed some snacks for dinner in that night. The atmosphere of the house was much improved, and it gave Eric more confidence as he saw the Yule fire grow a little throughout the day. A victory had been won, giving Alan his phone back, but also didn't take him long to get absorbed into it throughout the day. Eric knew that he needed to try and get Alan to accept his present, but he was worried about losing what progress he had made. For the remainder of the evening, Eric thought to himself in circles on what to do. He spent some time outside with Buddy to try and find answers in his flying companion. Even through this, he was good. Uh, even though he was good company, not even Buddy could settle Eric's mind on the correct course of action. Finally, Eric puffed out his chest, looked at Buddy, and said. I'm just going to ask him right now. I can't think of anything else, so I'm just going to go for it. Buddy seemed proud of this confidence and gave him a responding burp, 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 and nudged him towards the house. So with his head held high, Eric marched towards his home and into the living room where Eric was glued to his phone. Eric was determined, uh, was so determined he forgot to take off his winter clothes and just went straight into Alan's view. 
Okay, dude, what happened? Why aren't we friends anymore? Why do you hate me? When do we start drifting apart? I miss you. I want to be close to you again. Eric's confidence turned into an emotional roller coaster as he let it all out, something I'd never done with his brother before. And finally, why did you throw my gift into the fire? That hurt. With the final words leaving his mouth, he could hardly believe what he had just said. Alan looked at Eric, clearly not believing he had just heard as well. But he saw his brother on the verge of tears, and for the first time in 10 years, Alan sat up and put his phone down, hugged his little brother, and said, I'm sorry, Eric. In the glow of the Yule fire, they sat for a moment in silence, just holding each other. Alan was uh, the first to pull away and look at his floor, in the floor, embarrassed for showing a softer side to his brother. I'm sorry, but I also don't know what to say. And, and so I'm just angry. Angry at me? Eric asked. Sometimes, because you're a real idiot, Alan said with a chuckle. But really, I'm mad at myself. A lot. Why are you angry with yourself, Eric probed. Alan began to freeze up again. I really, I don't want to. It was just, he drifted off and looked into the Yule fire after a period of silence passed over them. Eric broke the silence by asking another question. What is Nefletoffel? It's pronounced Nefletoffel. The H is silent. Alan returned, saying it with confidence. Say it with me. Nefletoffel. Nefletoffel? Eric said with a faked confidence. So how do you know about it? I don't even know what it is. I didn't know what it was when I got it, uh, got it for you either. P please believe me. Considering how badly you pronounce it, I'm starting to believe you, Alan said with a slight smile. Then what is it if you know what, how to say it? Eric continued. Because Dad taught me how to play. Wait, when? Eric said, astonished. Before you can remember, it was right before, you know, when I turned five, he started to teach me, Alan replied. Can you teach me how to play? Eric tried his luck and grabbed the, uh, the slightly scorched box from the tree and placed it on the couch. Alan looked over at the cover of the box, seemed to get lost in memories for a second. He then placed his hands over the cover and felt, uh, felt the cardboard. It's the same one, he whispered. What do you mean, same one? Alan grabbed the box and tucked it under one arm. Eric, I gotta go to bed. We gotta help mom tomorrow, so good night. Wait, can you teach me how to play, Eric begged? Maybe, but just not tonight, okay? Okay, well, good night, I guess, said Eric with a confused tone. And with that, Alan headed upstairs with the box still under his arm, leaving Eric once again alone with only the Yule fire to keep him company. He looked into the fire, which was still small, but healthy inside. Well, Dad, I got him to take the game. I hope that's enough. Five more days. I'll see you again, I promise. Over the course of the next few days, Eric worked on his plan for the upcoming party while his mother was busy working and calling all of her co-workers to tell them about the potluck. Not all were as, expect, uh, were as excited to cook, but in the end, they all agreed it was better for them to help out since Patricia was hosting the party. Alan was aloof as he had always was, and he was not as angry or... Alan was aloof as he always was, but he was not as angry or mean towards Eric. He still wouldn't talk about the board game, no matter how many times Eric begged him to do so. The days seemed to take forever leading up to the New Year's Eve. Leading up to New Year's Eve, when the day finally came, he became nervous at the thought of failing and losing his father again. Whenever he felt worried, he would go to the ever glowing fire, uh, fire for warmth and comfort, as well as to speak with his father. Even though he never got a response, he always felt as if he heard he was what he was saying. While Alan and Patricia were busy finishing the Reba dish together. Eric slipped away into the forest to see Buddy before the party and to advise him on how he needed to behave. Okay, tonight's the night. If everything works out with the potluck, like Holly said, then by tomorrow my dad will be back and everything will be perfect again, Eric said. Err? Came the low and worried response of Buddy, the reindeer. What's the matter? Are you worried about all the people tonight? News of Alan's reindeer live stream has spread to all Patricia's co-workers, and now they wanted to meet the internet famous Buddy, to take selfies presumably. Patricia had, uh, to, had to use this as a, bag, a bargaining chip with a few of the guests to get them to cook their potluck meals. Eric had told Buddy a couple of days ago, and he did not seem happy about being on display for a bunch of strangers. Remember, you can't do any of the magic stuff you do. No flying and definitely no eating their phones. He had to maintain the, uh, we have to maintain the internet fame after all, Eric said jokingly. This did not seem to ease Buddy's nerves, but it gave Eric a good laugh. Just then, Buddy's ears perked up, showing that he heard something, and then Eric heard it too. It was the sound of tires on the gravel road leading up to their house. The first guests had arrived. All right, Buddy, it's showtime. 
Go around back and be on your best behavior. I'll go in and see if the potluck works its magic on everyone. Good luck. Eric uh, picked up his pace towards the house to see which of his mother's co-workers were uh, first to arrive. In total, there were eight people who were coming to the party, outside of Eric, Alan, and Patricia, and Buddy. The first to arrive was Susan Gomez, the executive director of the company. Her being there first did not surprise Patricia at all, as she had always made it a point to be early to events. Susan made her family's asada de bodas uh, recipe, a pork stew that was supposed to be pretty spicy. The next to arrive was Gerald Bates, one of the content writers, and one of the people that worked under Patricia. Gerald was originally born in Birmingham because of, uh, before migrating to the USA for a university a few years ago. He was one of the hardest to convince to cook since he lived alone and was pretty introverted. He didn't know anything he could do, but the prospect of seeing this famous reindeer convinced him to call his mom and learn her recipe for squidgy chocolate pear pudding. When Eric saw it, he thought it looked like mud he used to play as a, uh, in as a kid. Next to appear was Harold Yang, arriving by an Uber, an Uber, an Uber, uh, which had to be insanely expensive from the city. Harold was a product of the modern age and perfectly fit for this job. He was a junior analyst and was uh, gunning to replace Patricia at her job. Harold was plugged into the current trends and he lived the trends too. If it was popular, Her Harold had, to, had it or did it. Much like Gerald Yang, he didn't know how well. Much like Gerald, yeah. See, then again, this is where I totally messed up. <laughs> Much like Gerald, Yang, he didn't... I don't even know what I was trying to go for there. Much like Gerald, he did not know what to cook, but somehow he managed to bring a pretty great-looking dish. He said it was called Dai Fu Sat Kashu. Uh, not one, uh, no one understood what it meant, but he explained it as a tofu dish since he was a vegetarian. Upon inspection, Eric was not convinced uh, that he made it himself. The moment Harold and Gerald arrived, they both ran to investigate Buddy's uh, Buddy out back. When Eric looked through the kitchen window, he could see that the flash of the camera as they both uh, were taking pictures with Buddy. Eric could see Buddy uh, going to lick one of the phones and looked up to see Eric at the window glaring at him, so he stopped. The next to arrive was director of design Amesh Gupta and Thomas Gupta, the firm's accountant. They had met in the office and gotten married a couple of years ago. Thomas insisted on cooking something traditional, in, uh, traditionally Indian, um, as, despite Amesh's protest. So they brought up an eggplant dish called uh, Bangan Ka Barta. Even Eric couldn't, uh, couldn't complain about it because of how great it smelled. The last three arrived together. Derek Wagner, another accountant, uh, content writer, arrived with his wife, Rebecca Wagner. They were both about as uh, Wisconsin as they came and decided to make their family's recipe for Wisconsin potato salad. The Wagners had also given a ride to Renita Williams, the co final content writer of the firm. Renita was from a long line of Milwaukeeans and had decided to make her family's red velvet cake recipe. Renita and Derek were also very interested in the reindeer out back, so they quickly hurried to join Harold and Gerald in the social media frenzy. By the end, the only people left in the house were the boys, Susan Gomez and Patricia. Susan uh, approached Patricia with two glasses of wine and handed one to her. Patricia, I wanted to thank you for throwing this party together. You know, a few years ago, these were most com more common at, the wor at work. It's good to have one again. I remember, and that's why I wanted to have one again. It was different back in the day, wasn't it? Both Patricia and Susan were the oldest members of the firm, and both had, uh, firm, and both had started, started around the same time, just out of college. While never being close, they had a camaraderie for, a long, uh, long, for how long they worked together. They shared a small toast and went to go back and watch the young, uh, their young colleagues outside. Since Alan helped cook, Eric was stuck with the job of the, uh, setting the table for 11 people. Back when his dad was alive, he had family get-togethers all the time, so the family had a large dining room that hadn't been used in years. Eric could see through the fireplace, uh, could see through to the fireplace uh, as he was setting the table. As he lit the candles, his mom had dug out the basement. Dug, had dug out of the basement. He, as he lit the candles, his mother had dug out of the basement. He could almost feel his father's fire grow. This was it, he thought to himself. This is what Holly was talking about. Without the potluck, this party would have never been ended up like this. Mom would have never oh, would have overworked herself cooking for everyone, and look at her now. She seems happy and content with herself. Mom hasn't been this happy in so long. He finished up and went go uh, went to go tell his mom about the table was ready for everyone to come and start the dinner. He noticed everyone was outside, so he put on his boots and headed out to see everyone swarmed around Buddy. Eric was worried about Buddy's nerves, but it seemed those nerves were gone, and he loved the attention. Renita was even riding him, which uh, e Renita was even riding him, which meant Eric uh, made Eric a little jealous. 
while everyone else was taking videos and pictures. Even Alan was using his once swallowed phone to record again, trying to restore his social image again, no doubt. Eric tried shouting towards his mom, but everyone was laughing and talking so loudly he couldn't go through the noise. He finally walked up to her and pulled on her coat. Mom, we can start dinner. She turned to him with a big smile on her face. Okay, honey, you know. Okay, honey, you know. I didn't... Oh, sorry. Okay, honey, you know, I didn't like your friend here that much at first, but he, was, he has been the life of the party. I don't know where you found him, but I'm glad you did. Eric once again couldn't believe how happy she was. It was almost like she was in the years past. Eric looked back over to Alan, who was now climbing on Buddy's back with Renita to take pictures. After a few moments of laughter and fun, Patricia called for everyone to uh, head inside for dinner. As everyone was heading inside, Eric could tell Buddy already missed the attention. Come on, you big goof. You can stand next to the dining room window. We might even slip you some food. This seemed to brighten Buddy's spirit, so he trotted over to the window on the side of the house to hopefully continue his time in the spotlight. Eric smiled and headed inside to join the others. Everyone had to use different methods of warming up their food. Some in the oven, others in the microwave. Susan had her soup already heating on the stovetop while everyone was scrambling it to warm everything up. After a few hectic minutes, the table was filled with everyone's various dishes, the centerpiece being the Reba and the Horn family had made, that the Horn family had made. The Wagners pulled out some bottles of wine for everyone while Alec and, uh, Alan and Eric were stuck with grape juice, but it made them feel included. Eric couldn't believe it. He watched everyone ta uh, talking as they passed around the dishes to fill their plates, his brother and mother sitting next to one another in conversation, the fireless father glowing red hot in the living room with love. The plan was coming together, and all seemed like it was going to work compl uh, to complete the spell, until he saw the fire begin to die down. Wait, what is happening? All was going so well, he thought in a panic. He then started to look around and saw that Harold had pulled out his phone and, had, uh, and was absent from the conversation. And just like that, the snowball effect uh, commenced next to pull out their phone was a mesh, then Thomas, Renita, then Derek. Before Eric knew it, the conversation was completely, had, was completely disappearing as everyone was busy posting their pictures and videos uh, with Buddy. Just as the conversation was dying, his father's, uh, his father's fire was beginning to die as well. The once more roaring flames were dropping quickly. The worst was when he saw his mother, both his mother and brother leave the conversation and go into their own phones. Everyone was quickly, uh, just quietly eating and smiling to themselves as, she, uh, as the likes rolled in from their recent post. Eric was pan panicking on what to do. He scanned the room for inspiration. His eyes met the, met, uh, met the window where Buddy was standing, licking the glass, waiting for some food for, uh, waiting, wanting some food for himself. That's it. Okay, here it goes. Eric left the table without being noticed, went into the garage and picked up a bucket, and ran back into the dining room to make his dramatic move to save the night and his father. He grabbed a seat in the middle of the table and climbed on the chair to grab everyone's attention. Hello, everyone, guys, hey, please. Eric tried to build his confidence. Eric, what are you doing up there? Get down from there and enjoy your meal, his mother protested. Mom, we were enjoying the meal, and then you all disappeared, all of you. Eric looked down at the table, feeling sad for what else had disappeared in his life. He managed to pull himself together muster, and muster com more confidence. I have an idea. And I really hope you believe me. Let's just go this one meal without our phones, together. All of you work every day for these things. Don't let them have tonight, please. Eric looked around the table, and for the longest time, it felt like no one was said anything. Then Susan Gomez was the first to speak. You know, Patricia, your son is right. When, he had these, when we had these parties years ago, we never had our phones out. I'm in. Everyone shrugged in agreement and followed suit. Eric smirked and held up the bucket. An internet famous reindeer taught me recently, the best way to make sure you stay off your phones is to have your phone swallowed by a large mammal. But this bucket will be a little better, so everyone give them up. This made even Susan hesitate, almost like there was an invisible force stopping her from giving it up. Once again, a long period of silence fell over the table, and this time Patricia was the first to break the tension. Eric, I'm in. Let's do it, she said with a smile. She then reached out and looked out, uh, looked, took the little orange plastic bucket and dropped her phone in. She then passed it on to Susan on her left, who did the same, and then to Amesh and Thomas. Slowly but surely, everyone at the table gave up their phones to the bucket, all but Alan, who took a second longer to decide to drop his in. Eric collected the bucket and took it to the window. He opened it and handed the bucket out to Buddy, who understood his role in this plan. The reindeer bit down on the edge of the container and carried the bucket away. Eric then uh, came back to the table, happily sat up, and began to eat his dinner. At first, it seemed everyone didn't know what to talk about. There were very few small comments about how many likes they had gotten on their reindeer videos, but nothing more. 
Now that he removed his, this, this distraction, Eric, uh, distraction, Eric needed a thinkable way to bring back the conversation. And while thinking, he took a bite of Susan's uh, asada de bodas. And it was one of the best things he had ever had in his life. Oh my, who made this? It's delicious. Eric dove into his bowl with excitement. Everyone grabbed their bowls and tried the asada for themselves. And the reviews were a hit. They were all uncom uh, uh, They all had com uh, complimented how savory and spicy the soup was. Susan lit up and smiled warm and warmly to her co-workers. This was my papa's recipe. I haven't made it since I left Mexico as a child. We lived in the mountains of central Mexico. A lot of people didn't realize how cold it could get sometimes around the mountains there. And this soup was perfect for Christmas. Susan, I had no idea how good of a cook you were, Thomas said. Do you really think I could, do you think I could have the recipe? I know it's your family's, but you know how cold it can get up here. Several others also asked for the recipe and conversation began around, again, around the asada. Susan also shared with her father, uh, was now back, shared that her father was now back in Mexico. She hadn't seen him in over 10 years, that she wanted to go back in 2020, but couldn't. And now she wanted to see him because he was no longer, uh, may not be around much longer. Then you can make this for him, and I'm sure he'll be in the happiest father in the world, Patricia said to her colleagues. Renita was digging into Harold's uh, Fu Shashua, so, uh, as she was also a vegetarian. Harold, since Harold, since when did you cook? Why have you never done it before? And why have you never told any of the other vegetarians? She asked playfully. Uh, yeah, sorry, I never thought to tell you, but the, the truth is, I didn't cook it. My mom did, Harold replied shyly. You live with your mom? Renita questioned. No, of course not. My mom runs a little Vietnamese restaurant in Metcalf Park, Harold said, almost ashamed. Oh, wow. I never really knew you had family in town. You never talked with uh, talked about her. Derek added and also tried the Vietnamese tofu dish. Metcalf Park, is, uh, Metcalf Park is one of the poorest sides of Milwaukee, not a place you'd expect someone as fashionable and trendy as Harold. My mom is proud of me. She came here alone when I was a baby, she's great, makes great food, but never had a lot. Sending me to college took all she had. This seemed to be a sad subject for Harold, so Renita patted him on the shoulder and reassured him. She then added to Harold, Harold, your mom is so proud of you. She's an amazing cook. And she's an amazing cook. This got Renita and Harold talking privately. Eric's attention was now drawn to the potato salad that Derek and Rebecca had made. When he was asked, they mentioned that it was uh, made in their family, that, uh, the way it was over for a... <laughs> when he asked, they mentioned that it was made in their family the way uh, that way for over 150 years, and they uh, and they think it was brought over by Rebecca's family from Central Europe. Before Eric knew it, everyone was talking about the food and how good it was, and who taught them the recipes. Amesh was not uh, Amesh was not the one to cook the traditional Indian dish, but Thomas was. While it took a long time his family, uh, for his family to accept him, eventually Amesh's mother and father came to visit Amesh and Thomas at their house in Milwaukee. After seeing how happy they were, the family came together, embracing the two of them. Thomas took Amesh's mother right away. Took, took to Amesh's mother right away over a love of food, and now Thomas can cook almost every dish from Amesh's childhood. As the conversation continued, Eric could uh, tell his father's fire and the Yule log were growing bright in the living room once again. But still, there was one com uh, component he knew was missing to make the magic work, and that was Alan, who still had not spoken to him since giving up his phone. And the only dish he had not touched was the one he uh, he had made with his mother. The Reba. Patricia, I have to admit, I had no idea what this was when we sat down, but it's been my favorite thing. What did you call it again? Asked Gerald and uh, fading, uh, oh, sorry, I said I had to do this in a, a British accent. Don't hate me. Patricia, I have to admit, I had no idea this was what, uh, what this was when we sat down, but it's been my favorite thing. What did you call it again? Asked Gerald in his fading Birmingham accent. Patricia finished her sip of wine and looked surprised uh, uh, to be asked what about the meal. Well, I'm so happy to hear that, Gerald. It's called Reba? And while it's pork belly, really rich, and yeah, my the boy's father would make it. It was my grandma's recipe, and she passed it down to Dad. Alan mumbled under his breath. Eric had an idea. Hey, Alan, what was the key to making the Reba the way Grandma made it? Alan looked up towards his brother, and Eric held his breath in anticipation. Luckily, Alan took the bait. Well, Grandma always said the crispiness of the outside and with the tenderness of the inside was key. This is our fam uh, that our family had always had the best ratio of crispiness to tenderness in all the state and maybe the world. Dad always said the sauerkraut. Here it was, the point he got to last time before he stopped. And once again, Alan paused, getting lost in memory. 
It was at this time that Derek's wife, Rebecca, tried the sauerkraut for the first time and exclaimed, Oh my gosh, this is sauerkraut? I usually hate it. Alan, did you make this? It's wonderful. This caught Alan's attention and warmed up his face. Yes, I, I made it. Thank you. I, I didn't like sauerkraut either until my dad and grandma made it for me this first time. I really hated smelling it while they were cooking, but after giving, uh, but after giving me a dollar, my dad got me to try it. I knew from then on uh, that I wanted it every year. Well, Alan, you have done your dad proud. Rebecca really hates anything like this usually, Derek responded. Everything was going well, and Alan's spirits really seemed to be lifted. Then a question from Harold caught the family off guard. Patricia, I didn't know you were married. Is your husband at work or something? At saying this, Susan shot a glare over at Harold, who had asked such a uh, Harold for asking such a question, and he began to say something to, uh, to him. But Patricia put her hand on Susan to show everything was okay. My husband, Robert, passed away a few years ago. I didn't realize that not everyone at work knew at work. It hasn't been easy, so I don't talk about it much. He left a pretty big hole, a hole in the heart of the family, and it's been difficult to fill. Patricia responded, saying more than she said in years about uh, since Robert's passing. Well, I can tell, I think, do I have to do a Birmingham accent again? I think I do. No, this is Thomas. Well, I can tell you that he lives on the two boys here, Alan. Uh, two, your two boys here. Alan, I used to be a private chef, and I can tell you that you, uh, that you cook this dish with love and passion, Thomas said sincerely. And Eric, for someone as young as you to get nine adults to give up their cell phone for dinner, that was incredibly brave. I'm glad we did it. It reminds me now of the parties I had when I was just getting started in this career, Susan said warmly to the table. Eric was blushing, but saw an opportunity to make another brave move. So he grabbed his wine glass of grape juice and raised it in the air. Can I propose a toast? Everyone seemed shocked at hearing uh, this from an 11 year old, but quickly followed with their glasses of wine. Eric felt his throat close as he tried to speak. He began again, but couldn't seem to get the words out. But when he looked to see his mother and brother, he also raised their, who also raised their glasses, he felt the confidence build again. My dad would have loved tonight. He would have loved the food, all of you. He would love to hear all about your families. He loved people. I miss him. But tonight, I like to think he's watching us, wherever he is. So dad, this is to you. Eric raised his glass and took a drink of the grape juice. To Robert came Thomas. And then Gerald and Harold and Renita, Susan, Derek, Rebecca, Rebecca, and Amesh. To Robert, Patricia said with tears in her eyes. Alan was struggling to say the words, but through his own tears, he managed to say, to you, Dad, before drinking out of his glass. The conversation around food continued in the mood once more. Again, the mood again seemed to lift in the dining room. Patricia was red-eyed, but laughing when Susan beside her, with uh, laughing with Susan beside her. And it even seemed uh, some more toasts were on the way uh, for other members of the family of the group. Before he could hear them, Eric felt a tap on his shoulder. He turned to see Alan behind him. Eric, you still want to learn how to play Neffel Toffel? Uh, sure, Eric responded with a great surprise. And the two boys left the busy dinner party without being noticed and headed up to Alan's bedroom. Eric was so happy that he didn't notice, uh, Eric was so happy that he didn't notice the Yule Log was the brightest it had ever been. Now, Eric, you've got to understand, this game is weird, and it's kind of hard to learn. That's fine. I'll, I'll be fine. You're going to lose the first hundred matches. I can promise you that, Alan joked about, uh, with his little brother. When they got into his room, they sat up the board and the, on the bed, and Alan began to set up the pieces, describing them all to Eric. Now you have two teams, and they are not equal. Both have different jobs. The defender wants their king to get to safety. The attackers want to capture the, want to capture the king. And every piece can move like a rook and regular chess. Does that make sense? I think so. Should I be the attackers or the defenders? Eric asked in the confusion. We will start as the uh, we'll, uh, we will start you as the defenders since they are easier. Alan walked through uh, most of the tactics and details of the game, and then he did a practice round before starting. As they played, Eric reminded, uh, was reminded of the fun they used to have when they were younger. Hey, Alan, uh, do you know what I just realized? Eric said with a grin. What? You left your phone with Buddy and have not even thought about it. Oh, I've thought about it, but kicking your butt in a board game felt like a better way to spend my evening. The game continued uh, with some mistakes from both, uh, from both the novice Eric and the rusty Alan. The defenders had less pr uh, pieces than the attackers, but Eric managed to capture a couple of Alan's pieces. Hey, don't let me win, Eric said as he took another one of Alan's pieces. 
I think Dad let me win the first few times, too. But I also think it's impossible to win as attackers, Alan replied while taking one of Eric's pieces in retaliation. What was Dad like? Eric tried his luck. What do you mean? You knew him, Alan returned. Well, as a child, but I never got to know him older, you know. I was just getting started in school when it happened, so I only have memories of him when, when he treated me like a baby. First of all, you are still a baby, Alan chuckled. Eric smacked his shoulder uh, for the comment before uh, pushing for a real answer to the question. I guess I never thought about it like that. Dad was everything to me, and that makes it hard. The fact that he was so good as a dad is what makes, it the wor it makes him the worst dad now that he's gone. Alan could sense some agitation in Alan's voice. I'm confused. Do you hate Dad? I hate that he's not here. I hate that he taught me just enough of everything to know nothing. Like this stupid game. He taught me how to win. He never taught me how to win, just how to play. He taught me how to ride a bike, but didn't stick around long enough to teach me how to drive a car. Alan, he, he didn't choose to leave. He couldn't control that. I know, I know. And maybe it just feels better to hate him than have to deal with the fact that he's gone. Alan had seemed to stop caring about ta uh, taking Eric's game pieces and instead moving his pieces to the side of the board. I think I get it. But for me, the only connection I have is talking about him and hearing the stories for you, from you or Mom. But both of you don't, even, uh, don't ever do that. It sucks. Also, I really think you're letting me win now, Alan said as he slid his king outside, uh, outside of his castle. I'm sorry, Eric. It's okay. I think I understand why you don't talk about him. No, Eric... I'm sorry, because I just won. Eric looked over the board and didn't understand because his king had no attacking pieces near it. Then he looked around the board and realized that he also couldn't get the king uh, to the escaping squares. Alan had built a wall of pieces all the way around the board. Wow, you can do that? That's not fair, Eric protested. That's what I told Dad the first time he did it to me. I never, I never knew how he did it. I guess the key is to distract the other player until they pull it off, Alan teased. Eric playfully hit him again, and they both started to wrestle and laugh just like they used to. They then heard a series of noises of both of them that made them stop. Um, Eric, did you hear that? And why did it sound like Buddy is on the roof? Alan asked in a very concerned tone. Oh, probably because he is on the roof, Eric said with a shrug. Alan gave Eric a look of disbelief, which was quickly dispelled when Alan looked uh, out his second story window to see Buddy the reindeer head looking through. What are you doing up there? Eric uh, exclaimed as he opened the window. Er, came the reply with a head flick towards the forest. Sorry, er. Eric had almost forgotten that uh, that uh, what tonight was. He started towards the door with an excitement. Come on, Alan, we gotta get to the forest. Your pet reindeer is flying. Don't focus on that, we gotta go. Tonight is the night, uh, 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 Eric replied, pulling Alan's arm to get him away from the window. What is going on? Why do you still have to go into the forest? Why do you have to go in the forest exactly? Alan questioned as he let Eric pull him towards the door. Tonight, we hate to see Dad again. Chapter 11. The Wild Hunt. Okay, let me get this straight. You met an old man in the woods. He gave you a magic lock, a flying reindeer, and specific instructions on how to bring back our dad. Alan asked as his brother walked through the forest in the snow-covered... Uh, walked through the opening of the snow-covered forest. They managed to slip past the party guests without much of a notice as the wine started flowing after the boys went upstairs. Well, he wasn't as specific as I would like. His wife helped me uh, with most of the details, Eric replied. The wife, who gave you the Neffeltop award and blanket for me and Mom. Yep, now you're getting it. Eric had a spring in his step at seeing everything come together in the end. Let's say I believe you, Alan started. You're walking with me right now, came to Eric's smart reply. Yes, and if you somehow pulling, uh, if you're somehow pulling a trick on me, I'm going to beat the crap out of you. Alan threatened. If this doesn't work, then I'll just be just as upset. Come on now, I got to find Yule near. I think. With this, the boys pushed through the snow, the full moon leaving a bright glow over the forest floor. They looked up to see Buddy flying over them deeper into the forest. Where is he going? You think? Alan asked. Eric didn't reply as he looked through the perfect rows of pine of the pine forest, searching for Yule near spire. Nothing appeared so far, so they continued deeper uh, than Eric had gone the first night. They walked for at least 15 minutes, not hearing a noise behind, besides the crush of their boots on the snow. Okay, Eric, what's going on? You tricked me, didn't you? Is this just getting me back for taking down the decorations or something? Huh? Alan said in growing agitation. <laughs> taking down the decorations or something, huh? Alan said in growing agitation. I don't know. He didn't tell me. What I had to do now, just that Dad would come back. Yulnir, old man, where are you? Eric screamed into the forest with no reply. 
He tried a few more times to no success, and with each try, he seemed to anger Alan even more. I'm sorry, I, I really don't know what to do now, Alan tried in desperation to make sure Alan knew he had no idea what was going on. I swear, Eric, if I wasn't so cool, I would beat you right now. But I'm going back home, and when we get back, and I tell Mom about this, I'm sure you're going to get ground. Uh, you will get grounded too, Alan said in frustration. Right when Alan was about to leave, uh, they both heard a noise coming behind them, and then impossible. Uh, and then the impossible happened. Their father was walking towards them with Buddy at his side. Now, Alan, that's not the way to treat your brother, Robert said with a warm smile, peeking through his dark brown beard. Dad! Eric screamed at the top of his lungs, rushing towards his father at lightning speed. Robert kneeled down to embrace his youngest sons in his arms. No, this isn't possible. Who are you? My dad is dead, Alan said, tears streaming down his cheeks onto the frozen ground. I know it's crazy, and it's crazy for me too, but I heard what Eric said at dinner, and I also heard about Grandma's recipe, Robert said reassuringly. Alan approached his father now, looking at him, studying what he looked like. He was wearing different clothes than he had been worn, ever worn before. He looked as though he was going on a hunting trip from medieval times, but his face and his eyes were the same as Alan remembered. I also heard that everyone couldn't believe how good it was, and that I would be proud of you. Robert stood up, put his hand on his son's shoulders. And son, I am so proud of you. Alan no longer cared if it was a trick or a dream. He grabbed a hold of his father and brought each, uh, and they brought each other close in a heartfelt embrace. Eric had a, was a little shorter than his father and brother, but he hugged them both as best he could. I don't understand how this is happening, Alan said after a long moment of hugging. I thought your brother explained it to you on the way up here. It was a magic log, a flying, a flying reindeer, and a mystical gift from a woman at the mall. That about covers it, he said with a grin. Told you so, Eric said in victory. Okay, okay, magic is the answer, but I still don't understand how, Alan protested. This might be hard to explain, but our world is only one of several others that exist. When we leave this one, we only wake up in another. Normally we can't come back, but there are these windows where the distance between our worlds is less. And if we have the right way to come back, he said, looking towards Buddy, then we can come back for a time. But then why do we have to have the Yule Log? Eric joined in the questioning. That I don't know. I would guess Yule Near had something to do with that. Without it, I would only be able to observe you. I could not be here like I am now. Robert put his hands on the side of his son's head, his son's heads. I missed you both so much. A light came from the distance and a, uh, a light came from the distance and landed on the three of them in the forest. Robert? The voice came from Patricia, standing alone in the two snowy pines holding a flashlight, her eyes fixed on the image of her long-past husband's useful face looking back at her, like the first day they fell in love. Explain later, she said quickly as she rushed forward to kiss and hug the man she thought she would once spend the rest of her life with. Okay, so magic log, magic reindeer, and mystical gifts from old people. Patricia rationalized what she was just told by all three of her family members. Don't forget the multiple worlds, open windows, and magic old men, added Alan. It took a few extra minutes to catch Patricia up to the events of the last couple weeks. She had just left a party of her, co uh, her work colleagues to hunt for her children, only to find her late husband hugging them in the forest. This was a lot, to take in for, uh, a lot to take in for one night. But Robert, don't get me wrong, I'm excited to see you. But why us? Why are we the ones to get a visit from a loved one like this? Patricia inquired. I was hoping you wouldn't ask that. It's really complicated. While yes, most departed family members can't hug their loved ones again, we can observe and feel the love of our families. We rarely ever get to cross over. I wish there was a better way to explain this. Perhaps he can explain it better, Eric said with a cheerful smile as he saw a fire in the distance, a familiar, a familiar old white bearded man sitting near the glowing logs. The Horn family approached the fire, which had, only, uh, which had four convenient logs for everyone to sit on. It's a pleasure to meet you, Patricia, Alan, and Eric, you did well. The spell worked. You should be very proud, Yulnir said, greeting them. Now to answer the question of why in your family, the answer is because your father and husband was not meant to die when he did. What do you mean? Alan asked. Yulnir seemed to ease further into his seat and prepare himself to give a lesson. All of us are destined to do certain things. For some, it's to do great deeds, to be a hero, a mother, 
or a father, or perhaps someone who will change the world. And for others, it's to live a simple life. But within that, we all have freedom to make your own choices that lead us to these events. Your father and your husband was destined to do so much more during his life. Like what? asked Eric, both this, uh, bo Eric towards both his father and Yulnir. Sadly, I cannot say. I can only say that he was meant to do these things, and some force not of this world altered that fate, Yulnir revealed. What do you mean, not of this world? Patricia questioned. This is not the time for that story. There may come a time when I can share more, but for now, we have you have each other for tonight. And I'm intruding on that, so I must be off. Yulnir said as he got up from his stool. Now, Robert, you know the rules. I'll be back with the others soon. With that, Yulnir departed into the forest and quickly disappeared. What did he mean by that, dear? asked Patricia. I'm sorry. I can't stay for much longer. The window closes soon. If I'm not back, I won't be able to exist in this world with you, Robert said remorsefully. So this is it? All this for just for a few minutes together, Eric said, looking down to his feet. And if it was the best few minutes I could have hoped for, and we can have this every year on this night if we choose. The log you near gave you will never truly die. And if you bring it out every winter season and keep it glowing like you did tonight, then I can come back when the window opens once again. But now I'm, al I'm always with you. I'm part of you boys. And Patricia, my love, you have all of my heart, always. Robert said now with his own tears in his eyes. I have so many questions, Eric inquired. I think we all do, Eric, as Alan replied. And I wish I could answer all of them. But for now, all we can do is enjoy tonight, Robert pleaded. The four of them all agreed it was better not to waste the time they had left with questions that required too much explanation. They instead chose to share stories of their lives. Eric talked about his explorations in the forest and all the animals that he could identify just from their noises. Alan joked about having his phone swallowed by a reindeer and that he was finally able to use Robert's strategy to beat Eric at Neffeltoffel. Patricia talked about work and complained like a wife would about her co-workers and the problems she had at work. For what seemed like a briefest of times, their family was together and it felt just like it had before. However, Robert looked up to the night sky and saw something that made him remember that the reality of the reality of their situation. Sadly, it's time. I must go. Please come with me. Robert moved swiftly to get to his uh, get the family up and moving towards the moon, moonlit forest, which each step they took, the fire they had been sitting at around uh, disappeared, both from view but also from reality. The family came to the clearing of the forest and stopped following Robert's lead. Lead. What are we waiting for? Alan asked. Oh, you will like this. You thought magic logs and reindeers were a lot to figure out, Robert said as he smiled towards the night sky. Eric scanned the horizon with his father and then he saw it. Something coming towards them. In fact, it was a lot of somethings. There was a whole herd of flying reindeer coming towards them at fast speeds. At the head of the herd uh, was the, uh, the could see, at the head of the herd, they could see the white beard of Yulnir flying in the wind. The host of riders slowed down and landed all over the field. Over 100 riders in total now sat in front of Robert and his family. My friend, are you ready to go home? Robert asked Buddy. Rip, came back the reply as Buddy, Buddy trotted up to him. But then a sad er came as Buddy looked back towards Eric. It's okay, Buddy. Keep my dad safe. I'll see you next year, Eric said through hidden tears. And we will still have plenty of phones for you to steal too, added Alan. Did you just say you named him Buddy? Robert questioned, but Yulnir gave him a nudge and nodded. Well, that's a great name for one of the oldest reindeer in the universe, Eric. Robert corrected. No, I, ha I hate to say it, but we need to say our goodbyes. Patricia stepped forward first. You mean to say our until next times? They hugged and kissed and began to say their departing words. Eric became distracted by sights of Holly dressed in hunting clothes as well, riding a beautiful white reindeer next to Yulnir. It's good to see you again, Eric. Look back. Looks like the potluck worked. Holly greeted Eric with her signature warmth and smile. Closing up shop for the winter, Eric joked. Oh, you know, it's a seasonal job after all, she replied. Eric, there is one more thing I know you've forgotten, and I hope you take a look at it when you get back home. Eric thought for a second and remembered. My present, he shouted. I look forward to hearing about your adventures, my dear. Happy Yule, Holly, and good Yule to you, Eric. Holly replied warmly. Eric turned his attention back to his father, who was finishing goodbyes with Alan. Eric approached for, uh, for, uh, for his hug and farewell. 
He had all held on tight as he could for as long as he could. None of this would have been possible without none of this would have been possible without you. You have truly inherited your grandmother's love and spirit. If I have any parting advice before I go, visit her before it's too late. She'll want to see you how much you've grown. Robert told his son as he pulled away. I will, Dad. Can I talk to you even with the window being closed and all that other world stuff? You can, and I'll always hear you. I love you, son. Take care of your mother and brother for me, okay? Robert gave one final smile and reassuring hug before hopping onto Buddy and joining the other riders. Patricia, Eric, and Alan all grabbed one another as the host of riders came together around Yulnir and began to march away. They all waved to Robert until they could no longer see him in the herd of reindeer. As they took flight, they could hear the voice of the white-bearded Yulnir shout towards the earth, Good Yule to all. Patricia, Alan, and Eric all walked back together in the cold of that winter night, hearts full of warmth from their interactions with their father and husband, Robert. The three reflected on his final words, which gave them all hope for the coming year. To Alan, Robert gave, uh, any, words of, uh, gave words any father would give to his son. Alan, I'm sorry I could not be more of a father to you, and I wish I could be there to teach you so much more, but I cannot. You have to keep living and live a good life. Protect your father and your mother. Protect your brother and your mother and keep your word when you give it. The next piece of advice is something that Alan did not understand, but was told he would one day. When you see a cat with an eye of gold and an eye of old, follow it. Robert gave his wife, Patricia, this as a final it. Robert gave his wife, Patricia, this as his final parting words. My love, I wish I could always be by your side in life, and I will in my own way. I know it's hard, but you must find someone to keep you company in the long life ahead of you. Just make sure that he is worth something as it may be just make sure that he is worth someone as amazing as you. You try so hard, my dear, and you deserve love, someone that loves you in life for all that you are. I will see you over the Rainbow Bridge one day. I know it. Robert's advice to his son Eric has already been shared in this tale. However, there, the, what lingered most in Eric's mind were the words of Yulnir. Someone, someone or something had changed faith uh, so that his father would die. He was going to find out who that was, no matter how long it took him. As the family arrived back home, they found all the party guests asleep on the couches and the guest beds. The wine had done one this evening. Eric made haste to the little box Holly had given him uh, that was lying behind the Christmas tree. When he opened it, he found inside an ornament. It was a Buddy the Reindeer flying with Eric's father on his back. Holly knew all along I would make the spell work, Eric said to himself as he hung the ornament on the tree. With his family went up. With this, the family went off to bed, hearts fuller than they had been in years. As Eric lay down in bed, he thought of the future and the final words of his father to visit his grandmother once again. He then was struck with the idea he had to share with his brother. He was then struck with an idea he had to share with his brother. He flew from the bed and caught Alan as he was cleaning up the knuffle top of board. What is it? Alan questioned his excited brother. How do you feel about going to summer camp? And with that, Eric's story continues in A Midsummer's Tale coming soon. We did it! Thank you so much for going through the entirety of the live reading here. I really appreciate it. I, I hope you uh, are okay with all the stutterings and, and mishaps here, but I hope you enjoyed this story. And once again, if you are interested in picking up a copy, it is available down below. There should be a link to Amazon to pick up a copy of the Yule story. The sequel, A Midsummer's Tale, will be starting here soon and hopefully be released around the summer. Thank you for everyone who supported this work throughout the process uh, in the past, in the present, and in the future. I look forward to sharing you more of Eric's tales in the sequel. And thank you so very much. And until the hall, skull and happy Yule.